100th Day Worries by Marjorie Kyler, illustrated by Arthur Howard. Jessica was a worrier. She worried about everything. She worried about losing her first tooth and remembering her lunch money and missing the school bus and getting her math right. But on the 95th day of first grade, Jessica's teacher gave her something new to worry about. Next Friday will be the 100th day of school, Mr. Martin said. So I want each of you to bring in a collection of 100 things. They can be anything you want, but they should be small, like rubber bands or marbles. We'll display our collections out in the hall. Immediately, Jessica began to worry. Oh no, she groaned to herself. What will I bring? All weekend long, Jessica thought and thought. But each new idea brought new worries with it. 100 ice cubes? Too melty. 100 marshmallows? Too sticky. 100 toothpicks? Too pointy. That Sunday night at dinner, Jessica asked her family for ideas. How about 100 yo-yos? Suggested Tom. That's dumb, said Jessica. Where would I get 100 yo-yos? Maybe 100 lipsticks would work, said Laura. Jessica rolled her eyes. Laura might have that many tubes of lipstick, but Jessica sure didn't. We know you'll think of something, said Mom and Dad. You have until Friday. On Monday, the 96th day of school, Jessica watched as Bobby gave Mr. Martin five bags of peanuts. There are 20 peanuts in each bag, Bobby explained. Great, said Mr. Martin. Why didn't I think of peanuts, Jessica wondered. On the 97th day of school, Jessica watched as Sharon piled paper clips into 10 neat stacks on Mr. Martin's desk. 100 paper clips in all, Sharon announced. Wonderful, said Mr. Martin. How did she find so many, wondered Jessica. On the 98th day of school, Jessica watched as Ashley brought in 100 peppermints. I ate a few, she admitted, so I really only have 95. She promised to bring in five more peppermints the next day. Fantastic, said Mr. Martin. Jessica's stomach felt queasy. By the time Jessica went to bed on the 99th day of school, she still hadn't thought of anything to bring. On Friday morning, she sat at the breakfast table and stared at her cereal. Jessica, asked Mom, what's wrong? Today is the last day to bring in 100 things for the 100th day of school, and I still haven't thought of the right thing, she said. I've only come up with stuff that's too melty or too sticky or too pointy. I'll be the only kid without anything to show, and everyone will make fun of me. Jessica began to cry. Don't worry, said Dad. I have an idea. He pulled open one of the kitchen drawers. Here are some ribbons, he said, giving Jessica a handful of scraps. Jessica counted. Three red, two green, two yellow, two purple, and one striped. Mom ran down to the cellar and brought back a jar. Here are some screws, she said, dumping a pile on the table. Jessica counted. Four big, four small, one giant, and one tiny. Here are some rocket-shaped erasers from my collection, said Tom. Four pink, three green, two white, and one yellow. Here are some beads from my necklace that I broke, said Laura. Three round, four oval, two square, and one shaped like a smiling cat. I'll get some buttons from my shirt drawer, said Dad. He found five black, three brown, and two white. Here's some loose change from my purse, said Mom. Ten pennies and ten nickels. Here are ten barrettes. I don't need any more, said Laura. Here are some rocks from Iggy's Aquarium, said Tom. Six brown, three green, and one sparkly. How much stuff do we have so far, asked Mom. Jessica looked at the stuff on the table. It wasn't 100 of anything, but at least she had something to show. Something was better than nothing. There's the bus, said Mom. Here's a bag for your things. Don't forget your lunch. Jessica shoved everything into the bag and ran to catch the bus. All morning, Jessica thought about the stuff in the bag. She tried to remember the things her family had given her. Ten ribbons, ten screws, ten erasers, ten beads, ten buttons, ten pennies, ten nickels, ten barrettes, ten rocks. That came to ninety. She needed ten more. Where could she get ten more things? Oh no, here came her worries again. At lunch, Jessica found a note in her lunchbox. Sweetie, we'll help you find more stuff this weekend. I'm sure Mr. Martin will understand if your collection is late. Don't worry. Love, Mom. X, 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 X. Suddenly, Jessica had a great idea. She smiled to herself as 
she waited for lunch to be over. After story hour, Mr. Martin said it was time to put their 100 things out in the hall. What did you bring, Jessica? He asked. Here are 10 ribbons from my dad, she said. 10? asked Mr. Martin. And 10 screws from my mom, said Jessica. The other kids came over to look. And 10 erasers from my brother and 10 beads from my sister, said Jessica. Pretty, said Anita. And here are 10 buttons from my father and 10 pennies and 10 nickels from my mother and 10 barrettes from my sister and 10 rocks from my brother's iguana's aquarium, said Jessica. Cool, said Leslie. And what's this? asked Mr. Martin. It's 10 kisses from my mom, said Jessica. See, I brought in 100 things my family gave me, said Jessica. Is that okay? Wow, said Mr. Martin. I've seen a lot of great collections for the 100th day of school, but this one, Jessica swallowed. This one is really special, said Mr. Martin. You've brought in 100 bits of love. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. A Letter from Your Teacher on the First Day of School Written by Shannon Olson Illustrated by Sandy Sonke Dear student, this is a little welcome note I want to share with you. Believe all that I'm about to say because every word is true. There are a few important things I'd like for you to know. All throughout the school year, our relationship will grow. I cannot wait to get to know you and all the things that make you, you. Do you play sports or like to draw? Maybe you even do kung fu. I'll get to meet your family and hear the places you have been. I want to know your favorite subject and see awards that you may win. I promise every morning to greet you with a smile. We'll give high fives and hugs or fist bump if that's your style. I will celebrate with you when you have exciting news, like it's my dog's birthday, or I got brand new shoes. I'm here so you can learn a lot of science, math, and reading. I'll help you with your writing and all the skills you will be needing. But learning is not just about the schoolwork that we do. Some values that I hope you'll gain are empathy and kindness too. You can also be respectful by listening with your ears and eyes. Follow directions the first time and take good care of your supplies. I want you to set high goals and persevere through any test. When it comes to working hard, I expect you'll try your very best. Some days will be a challenge. You may think, I just can't do it. Even when you cannot yet, I am here to help you through it. Hooray! I'm going to try to make you laugh and put a smile on your face. We will make learning lots of fun. This is our happy place. I'm excited that you're here. Day by day, I hope you'll see I love being your teacher. And you mean so much to me. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Party Pooper by Hugh Lewis Jones and Ben Sanders. This is pineapple, and this is pea. They love to party. This is apple. He also loves to party, especially when it all goes wrong. It's Granny Smith's birthday. Everyone is invited. There'll be face painting. There'll be plenty of treats. There'll be party games, even a piñata. There'll be music for dancing. And don't forget the presents. Now, what's next? Surely Bad Apple won't wreck this, too. The party's over for you, Bad Apple. It's a wrap. Blow out the candles. One, two, three. Make a wish, Granny. What will it be? Let me down, Granny. Say please. Apple Grumble by Hugh Lewis Jones and Ben Sanders. This is Apple. He's still a nasty piece of fruit. 
And now he's grumpy too. This is Granny Smith, one of the oldest apples. Perhaps she can teach him some manners. You drank peas tea and stole cat's hat and other naughty things like that. Apple, it's time you behaved. But Apple doesn't want to be nice. No way. He's got other plans. You should be sweet like us. Here come Red and Golden, two delicious apples. Teamwork makes the dream work. Here comes Bramley, Brayburn, and Cox, three popular apples. It's not cool to be angry, man. Here come Honeycrisp, Gala, Pink Lady, and Jazz, four fabulous apples. Hey guys, where's the party? And here comes Pineapple. What? He's not even an apple. This book is too crowded for Apple's taste. Has he made friends? Can he be good? What do you think? Ten not so happy apples and a pineapple. One very bad apple. Bad apple is happy. No need to grumble. Now all the rest are covered in crumble. Where's the party? This is not cool, man. Help! Let us out! Say please. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Balloons Over Broadway, the true story of the puppeteer of Macy's Parade by Melissa Sweet. Anthony Tony Frederick Sarg, 1880-1942. Every little movement has a meaning of its own. Tony Sarg. From the time he was a little boy, Tony Sarg loved to figure out how to make things move. He once said he became a marionette man when he was only six years old. His father had asked him to feed their chickens at 6.30 in the morning, every day. Tony had an idea. What if he could feed the chickens without leaving his bed? He rigged up some pulleys and ran rope from the chicken coop door to his bedroom window. That night, he spread chicken feed outside the chicken coop door. The next morning, Tony pulled on the rope and the door to the chicken coop opened. The chickens ate their breakfast, Tony stayed snug in his bed, and his dad, so impressed, never made Tony do another chore. Step 1. Spread feed the night before. 2. Pull rope. 3. Door opens. 4. Chickens come out. When Tony grew up, he moved to London, where he discovered that no one was making marionettes for kids anymore. So out of wood, cloth, and strings, Tony began to make puppets. He figured out ways to make his marionettes movement so lifelike that they performed as if they were real actors. Word soon spread about Tony's amazing marionettes. When Tony moved to New York City, the Tony Sarg marionettes began performing on Broadway. In the heart of New York City, in Herald Square, there was the biggest store on earth, R.H. Macy's Department Store. Macy's had heard about Tony's puppets and asked him to design a puppet parade for the store's holiday windows, so Tony made New puppets based on storybook characters, then attached them to gears and pulleys to make them move. In Macy's Wondertown windows, Tony's mechanical marionettes danced across the stage, as if by magic. All day long, they performed to shoppers jostling for a better look. But Macy's had an even bigger job in store for Tony. Many of the people working at Macy's were immigrants, and as the holidays approached, they missed their own holiday traditions of music and dancing in the streets. Macy's agreed to put on a parade for their employees, and they hired Tony to help. Tony, too, was an immigrant, so he loved the idea of creating a parade based on street carnivals from all over the world. He made costumes and built horse-drawn floats, and Macy's even arranged to bring in bears, elephants, and camels from the Central Park Zoo. The animals joined hundreds of Macy's employees on Thanksgiving Day, 1924, winding their way from Harlem to Herald Square, it was a dazzling parade. In fact, Macy's first parade was such a success that they decided to have one every year on Thanksgiving Day to celebrate America's own holiday. Each year, the parade grew, but when Macy's brought in lions and tigers, in addition to the bears, elephants, and camels, the animals roared and growled and frightened the children. Tony, can you think of something spectacular? 
Macy's asked Tony to replace the animals. Okay. Tony hoped to replace the animals with some kind of puppets, but his marionettes were less than three feet tall. He would have to make much larger puppets in order for them to be seen in the parade. And how could he make them strong enough to hold up in bad weather, yet light enough to move up and down the streets? Tony knew of a company in Ohio that made blimps out of rubber, the perfect material for any weather. When he called the company and showed them his sketches, they agreed to make what Tony wanted. Still, how would Tony make his big puppets move? Then, Tony had an idea from an Indonesian rod puppet in his toy collection. On Thanksgiving Day, Tony's creatures, some as high as 16 feet, spilled into the streets, and the crowds cheered wildly. Part puppet, part balloon, the air-filled rubber bags wobbled down the avenues, propped up by wooden sticks. But now the sidewalks were so packed with people that only those in the first few rows could really see the parade. Tony realized his puppets would have to be even bigger and higher off the ground. And though the sticks helped to steer the puppets, they were stiff and heavy. Tony wanted his balloons to articulate, to move and gesture, more like puppets. But how? With a marionette, the controls are above and the puppet hangs down. But what if the controls were below and the puppet could rise up? During the next year, Tony set his new idea into motion. This time, he asked the company in Ohio to make balloons out of rubberized silk as strong as rubber, but lighter than rubber alone. Most important, Tony ordered the balloons to be filled not just with air, but with helium too. Since helium is lighter than air, it would make the balloons rise. Once the puppets were completed, they were deflated and shipped back to Tony in New York. Tony did not know if everything would go as planned. What if the balloons are filled with too much helium? What if one hits a sharp object? Will they fit under the, el the elevated train track? It was still dark on Thanksgiving morning when Tony filled the balloons with helium, tethering them down with sandbags. By 1 p.m., the sidewalks were packed with people ready for the parade. Then, one by one, Tony cut the lines to the sandbags. Let's have a parade! And the magnificent upside-down marionettes rose up to the skies. Nodding and waving to the crowds below, they sailed past Central Park. They sallied down Broadway. They shimmied and swayed through the canyons of New York City. High above the crowds, they flounced in the afternoon wind, pulling the rope handlers this way and that. Yet, with every heave-ho, the balloons gestured and articulated like wild puppets, and the crowd screamed for more. After the balloons were eased under the L, they ended in front of Macy's, at Tony's Wondertown windows. It was a parade New Yorkers would never forget. And from that day on, every Thanksgiving morning, crowds have lined the sidewalks of New York City to see what new balloons would rise to the skies for Macy's famous parade. Tony Sarg, the puppeteer who loved to figure out how to make things move, had set the stage with a little rigging for a puppet to be anything anyone could imagine it to be. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. The Best Pet of All by David LaRochelle, illustrated by Hanako Wakiyama. On Monday, I asked my mother if I could have a dog. A dog is a good pet, I said. No, she said. Dogs are too messy. On Tuesday, I asked my mother if I could have a dog. A dog is a very good pet, I said. No, she said. Dogs are too loud. On Wednesday, I asked my mother if I could have a dog. A dog is the best pet of all, I said. No, she said. No dogs. On Thursday, I asked my mother if I could have a dragon. A dragon, she said. I have never heard of a dragon for a pet. She thought a bit. If you can find a dragon, you can keep it for a pet. Dragons are not easy to find. There were no dragons in the park. There were no dragons at the beach. There were no dragons in the woods. There were no dragons at the zoo. At last, I found a dragon. This dragon was at the drugstore. He was wearing dark glasses and a hat. I asked the dragon to come home with me. The dragon said no. You can sleep in my bed, I said. He still would not come. You can play with my toys, I said. 
The dragon said yes. Dragons like to play with toys, but they do not like to put them away. They do not like to help with chores, and they make a mess in the kitchen. They roast hot dogs in the living room, and they dance to loud music all night long. My mother did not like this dragon. She asked the dragon to please leave. The dragon would not go. Then she told the dragon to leave now. The dragon still would not go. Finally, my mother got angry. She stomped her foot. She told the dragon to leave this minute or else. The dragon just shook his head. He went back to eating spaghetti in the bathtub. Too bad we do not have a dog, I said. Dragons do not like dogs. The dragon looked worried. Dragons are afraid of dogs, I said. The dragon began to shake. A dog would chase the dragon away, I said. The dragon ran to my toy box and jumped inside. Maybe you are right, my mother said. Maybe we need a dog. I put a sign in the window, dog wanted. Soon there was a knock at the door. It was a dog. The dragon saw the dog. He grabbed his hat and ran out the door. Thank goodness we have a dog, said my mother. A dog is a good pet. My dog wagged its tail. Yes, I said. A dog is the best pet of all. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Lego Pirates Brickbeard's Treasure by Hannah Dolan. Ahoy, me hearty! That means, hello, my friend, to a pirate. This fierce pirate is called Captain Brickbeard. He is the captain of this ship. It is called Brickbeard's Bounty. Captain Brickbeard and his crew sail the high seas in Brickbeard's Bounty. They are always looking for treasure and adventure. Let's go aboard the ship and have a look around. Look at the top of the ship and you will see a black flag. The flag has a skull and some bones on it. It is called the Jolly Roger. It will scare the pirate's enemies away. Arr. Can you see the pretty mermaid on the ship? She is called a figurehead. The pirates hope that she will bring the ship good luck in stormy seas and shark-filled waters. The ship has powerful cannons. The pirates use them when they do battle with their enemies. The pirates' enemies are other treasure seekers on the high seas. The soldiers of the king's navy protect the high seas from the pirates. They are always looking for pirates who are up to no good. The king's soldiers are the pirates' biggest enemies. Sometimes the king's soldiers take the pirates' treasure. Sometimes the pirates steal theirs. What's this? One of the pirates has found an old treasure map. The cross on it tells him where the treasure is buried. This soldier wants the map too. Look out! He is firing cannonballs with his big cannon. An old pirate is guarding treasure on this island. His pirate ship left him behind. The pirates and the king's soldiers have found the treasure. Who will reach it first? These pirates have some treasure. They are on a wooden raft. The raft floats along very slowly. The pirates are taking their treasure to Brickbeard's bounty. This sea monster is another enemy of the pirates. It loves shiny treasure too. It has eight arms to help it steal the pirates' treasure. The pirates must keep their treasure safe. They hide it in their secret hideout. It has hidden traps to scare away enemies. Look out, pirates! These soldiers have found your hideout. This is the king's navy fortress. It is where the king's soldiers keep their treasure safe. Look! Captain Brickbeard wants to steal the soldier's treasure. The fortress has a prison cell. The soldiers have locked up a pirate in the prison cell. Look who is here to rescue him. Captain Brickbeard's clever pet monkey is trained to steal things. He steals the key to the prison cell and sets the pirate free. Now you know all about pirates. You could be one too. You can enjoy your own pirate adventures. Goodbye, me hearty, says Captain Brickbeard. Arrgh. Glossary. Page 6, Treasure. Page 8, Flag. Page 10, Figurehead. Page 20, Raft. Page 26, Fortress. And page 28, Prison Cell.
Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Charlie and the New Baby by Reed Drummond, illustrated by Diane DeGroat. Well, howdy. Charlie the Ranch Dog here. You can just call me Charlie. Life sure is good out here on the old ranch. The sun is shining, the kids are playing, the birds are chirping, the cattle are happy. And Mama is rubbing my belly. I love it when Mama rubs my belly. Ah, uh, life doesn't get any better than this. It's good to be the king of the ranch. Snort? Huh? What did I miss? Where are the kids? Where's Mama? Wait, what's that? They're carrying a calf. What's going on? What are they doing? Wait, they're taking the calf in the house? But everyone knows calves don't belong in the house. I'd better go investigate. I have now officially seen everything. Well, this calf does look brand new. She must be a brand new baby. Maybe she's lonely. Maybe she has lost her mama. Maybe she needs a little tender loving care. Mama said the kids are perfect for that job. They give me tender loving care all the time. They scratch my ears. They feed me lunch. Lunch is my life. They spend time with me, and they tuck me into bed at night. Yep, it's all TLC. All the time for me. Hey, that's my blanket. I've always loved that blanket. Now they're giving the calf a bath? Hmm, it's been a while since I've had one of those. Wait, where's Mama going? Maybe she's making me dinner. Yum, dinner is my life. Wait, what? Huh? Hark! Do you hear that sound? That's the sound of my stomach growling. I haven't eaten in a long, long time. At least an hour. I'm so hungry, I could faint. Hey! Now they're tucking her in? In my bed? That's exactly how they tuck me in. Boy, that soft bed of mine sure does look comfy. Is it bedtime already? But what about my bed? What? I have to sleep on the floor? Oh no, say it ain't so. Oh well, nothing really left to do but get some shut eye, I guess. Maybe I'll dream about a happier time long, long ago. A time when a dog could lie on his own bed. A time when a dog could get a bath and a belly rub from time to time. A time before this silly old calf ever showed up. A time when, when, hmm, snort, huh? Now this is more like it. Don't worry everyone, there's plenty of me to go around. And looks like there's enough tender loving care around here for everyone, even Abigail. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Curious George by H.A. Ray. This is George. He lived in Africa. He was a good little monkey and always very curious. One day, George saw a man. He had on a large yellow straw hat. The man saw George too. What a nice little monkey, he thought. I would like to take him home with me. He put his hat on the ground and, of course, George was curious. He came down from the tree to look at the large yellow hat. The hat had been on the man's head. George thought it would be nice to have it on his own head. He picked it up and put it on. The hat covered George's head. He couldn't see. The man picked him up quickly and popped him into a bag. George was caught. The man with the big yellow hat put George into a little boat and a sailor rowed them both across the water to a big ship. George was sad, but he was still a little curious. On the big ship, things began to happen. The man took off the bag. George sat on a little stool, and the man said, George, I'm going to take you to a big zoo in a big city. You will like it there. Now run along and play, but don't get into trouble.
George promised to be good, but it is easy for little monkeys to forget. On the deck, he found some seagulls. He wondered how they could fly. He was very curious. Finally, he had to try. It looked easy, but... Oh, what happened? First this, and then this. Where is George? The sailors looked and looked. At last, they saw him struggling in the water and almost all tired out. Man overboard! The sailors cried as they threw him a life belt. George caught it and held on. At last, he was safe on board. After that, George was more careful to be a good monkey until, at last, the long trip was over. George said goodbye to the kind sailors and he and the man with the yellow hat walked off the ship onto the shore and on into the city to the man's house. After a good meal and a good pipe, George felt very tired. He crawled into bed and fell asleep at once. The next morning, the man telephoned the zoo. George watched him. He was fascinated. Then the man went away. George was curious. He wanted to telephone too. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What fun! ding a ling, -a -ling. George had telephoned the fire station. The firemen rushed to the telephone. Hello? Hello? They said, but there was no answer. Then they looked for the signal on the big map that showed where the telephone call had come from. They didn't know it was George. They thought it was a real fire. Hurry, hurry, hurry! The firemen jumped onto the fire engines and onto the hook and ladders. Ding dong, ding dong! Everyone out of the way! Hurry, hurry, hurry! The firemen rushed into the house. They opened the door. No fire! Only a naughty little monkey. Oh, catch him, catch him, they cried. George tried to run away. He almost did, but he got caught in the telephone wire and... A thin fireman caught one arm, and a fat fireman caught the other. You fooled the fire department, they said. We will have to shut you up where you can't do any more harm. They took him away and shut him in a prison. George wanted to get out. He climbed up to the window to try the bars. Just then, the watchman came in. He got on the wooden bed to catch George, but he was too big and heavy. The bed tipped up, the watchman fell over, and quick as lightning, George ran out through the open door. He hurried through the building and out onto the roof, and then he was lucky to be a monkey. Out he walked onto the telephone wires. Quickly and quietly over the guard's head, George walked away. He was free. Down in the street, outside the prison wall, stood a balloon man. A little girl bought a balloon for her brother. George watched. He was curious again. He felt he must have a bright red balloon. He reached over and tried to help himself, but... Instead of one balloon, the whole bunch broke loose. In an instant, the wind whisked them all away, and with them went George, holding tight with both hands. Up, up he sailed, higher and higher. The houses looked like toy houses, and the people like dolls. George was frightened. He held on very tight. At first, the wind blew in great gusts. Then, it quieted. Finally, it stopped blowing altogether. George was very tired. Down, down he went. Bump! Onto the top of a traffic light. Everyone was surprised. The traffic got all mixed up. George didn't know what to do. And then he heard someone call. George! He looked down and saw his friend, the man with the big yellow hat. George was very happy. The man was happy too. George slid down the post and the man with the big yellow hat put him under his arm. Then he paid the balloon man for all the balloons. And then George and the man climbed into the car and at last away they went. To the zoo. What a nice place for George to live. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Thomas and Friends, Day of the Diesels, a little golden book.
illustrated by Tommy Stubbs. One beautiful morning on the island of Sodor, Thomas and Percy were enjoying a ride in the country. Suddenly, they saw black smoke in the sky. They raced to find out what was the matter. An old farm shed was on fire. Percy and Thomas let firefighters take buckets of water from their tanks to put out the blaze. But it was slow work. Luckily, a new engine named Belle arrived. She shot water from two spouts on her tanks. The flames fizzled out. Back at the steamworks, everyone cheered for Belle. Thank you, she peeped. But I'm not a real fire engine. You need Flynn the fire engine. He's fast and fearless. He's a real hero. The next day, Thomas took Belle on a tour of the island of Sodor. They forgot to invite Percy. He felt left out and very alone. Diesel oiled up next to Percy. He invited Percy to visit the diesel works. You'll be our special guest, he hissed. Steamies didn't usually go to the diesel works, but Percy wanted friends who had time for him. He wanted to be a special guest. Percy enjoyed his visit. All the diesels were very friendly, but the building was dingy, old, and dirty. They didn't even have a crane. You need a new diesel works, Percy said to Diesel 10. I will ask Thomas to tell Sir Topham Hat. He always listens to Thomas. Diesel 10 liked this idea. Percy raced back to the steamworks to tell Thomas about his adventure, but Thomas was too busy to listen. Flynn the fire engine had arrived, and Thomas was showing him around Sodor. That night, Percy saw something that really troubled him. Flynn was in Percy's berth at Tidmouth Sheds. Percy decided not to stay where he wasn't wanted. Percy puffed to the diesel works. He brought Kevin because he knew the diesels didn't have a crane. We'll both be needed at the diesel works, Percy peeped. The next morning, Percy told the steamies where he had been all night. Everyone was amazed. Percy asked Thomas if he could help the diesels get a new diesel works. They chugged off together to talk to Diesel 10. But Diesel 10 no longer wanted Thomas's help. We're going to take over the steamworks, said Diesel 10. We want you to lead us, Percy. Percy felt grander than Gordon. He and the diesels rolled away, leaving behind a very angry Thomas. But when they reached the steamworks, the diesels wouldn't listen to Percy. The steamworks is ours, Diesel 10 roared, and we're not giving it back. To make matters worse, Percy discovered that Thomas was being held prisoner at the diesel works. Percy hurried to help Thomas. As he screeched to a stop, sparks flew from his wheels. Some oily rags caught fire, and flames spread across the diesel works. Percy knew he needed Flynn's help. He found the bold red engine, and together they rushed back to the diesel works. Flynn put out the fire, while Percy saved Thomas. Percy and Thomas then raced to the steamworks to stop the diesels. As they rolled along, they collected their friends, Belle, Edward, Henry, Gordon, James, Toby, and Emily. They all knew that friends are strongest when they stick together. The diesels were surprised to see the steamies, but they refused to leave the steamworks until Sir Topham Hat arrived. He was very cross. Diesel 10, he said sternly, you have caused confusion and delay on my railway. It was always my plan to build a new diesel works, Sir Topham Hat explained, but everything takes time. Now the diesels and the steamies must work together to build a new diesel works. Soon the new diesel works was finished. At the grand opening, the diesels beamed and the steamies peeped proudly. Everyone was happy, especially Percy and Thomas. They were best friends again. Thanks for watching! Click subscribe! Thomas and Friends, Diesel 10 means trouble. Based on the feature film, Thomas and the Magic Railroad, illustrated by Richard Courtney, created by Britt Alcroft. Thomas the Tank Engine was a little blue engine who always tried to be really useful. And all his friends lived on the island of Sodor. Life on the island of Sodor was very peaceful and happy. But on this beautiful island, where trains could talk and the railroad was really reliable and right on time, 
trouble was brewing. Sir Topham Hat, the railroad director, was going on a vacation. Mr. Conductor, who traveled from place to place in a shower of gold dust, was coming to help him out. I have to go and meet Mr. Conductor, Thomas said. He's going to take care of us while Sir Topham Hat is away. I think we can take care of ourselves, huffed Gordon. Whoosh! Suddenly, a big diesel engine raced past them. Get out of my way, you blue puffballs, the diesel growled. What was that? asked Gordon nervously. That was a problem, Thomas said as the diesel screeched away. That's Diesel 10. Sir Topham Hat sent him to help us steam engines, but Diesel 10 is behaving as though he hates us. I think he's a really scary engine. Ha! grumbled Gordon. Really useful engines like us have to be brave, little Thomas. Thomas agreed, but he couldn't help feeling frightened. Meanwhile, Diesel 10 was planning to get rid of the steam engines once and for all. He wanted to run the railroad. That night, Diesel 10 sneaked up to the engine shed and threatened Mr. Conductor with his jagged claw. Make the most of tonight, Twinkle Toes, hissed Diesel 10, because you won't like tomorrow. Mr. Conductor had another problem, too. I've suddenly lost all my sparkle, he sighed to Thomas. To get it back, I must find some more gold dust. Thomas and the other engines knew they had to help Mr. Conductor find the source of the magic gold dust. While the boss Sir Topham Hat is away, we cats will play, purred Diesel 10 to his pals. Splatter and Dodge gulped. We're going to make life miserable for those steaming heaps of trash on wheels, Diesel 10 continued. This island doesn't need them, it needs diesels. There's no use for steam engines these days, they're history. But what about Mr. Conductor? asked Splatter. Isn't he going to stop us? Dodge asked. Mr. Conductor needs his magic gold dust to keep an eye on us, snickered Diesel 10. And I know he can't, because he's just run out. A door opened on Diesel 10's cab roof, and out came his huge metal claw. I'll take care of all of them with this, said Diesel 10. He lifted his claw high above them, but then it dropped and hit him on the head. I don't think he meant to do that, Splatter and Dodge said to each other. Little did the Diesels know that Toby the tram engine had overheard their plans. Toby told the other engines. Then he followed the Diesels to see what they were going to do next. The Diesels were plotting to destroy the magic buffers that led to Mr. Conductor's magic railroad. We don't know where the entrance to the magic railroad is, and we don't know which are the right buffers to destroy, said Diesel 10 to Splatter and Dodge, so we'll have to destroy all of them. Toby knew he had to do something to stop Diesel 10. I've got to distract him, thought Toby. Cling! Toby rang his bell as loud as he could. It's the oldest teapot, shouted Diesel 10. Smash him! Diesel 10 tried to catch Toby with his claw, but he knocked over a pile of scrap right onto his own tracks. Diesel 10's path was blocked. Uh, boss, did you mean to do that? Asked Splatter and Dodge. Err, Diesel 10 growled. I always mean what I do. Diesel 10 was mad when he found out that Thomas had traveled the magic railroad to bring back Lady, the golden engine. Lady was the source of the magic gold dust. She could help Mr. Conductor foil Diesel 10's plans. Diesel 10 chased Lady, but Thomas raced between them. All three engines headed toward a dangerous old viaduct. Lady crossed the old viaduct. Stones began to fall. When Thomas crossed the viaduct, more stones fell, and a big gap appeared in the track. Thomas jumped the gap just in time. But Diesel 10 couldn't stop, and he tumbled far below onto a barge filled with sledge. Lady was safe, and there would always be plenty of gold dust. You're a really useful engine, Gordon told Thomas. Peep, peep, Thomas said, and puffed home into the sunset. Thanks for watching! 
Click subscribe. Oh, the places you'll go by Dr. Seuss. Congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own, and you know what you know, and you are the guy who'll decide where to go. You'll look up and down streets, look them over with care. About some you will say, I don't choose to go there. With your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down any not-so-good street. And you may not find any you'll want to go down. In that case, of course, you'll head straight out of town. It's opener there, in the wide open air. Out there, things can happen, and frequently do, to people as brainy and footsy as you. And when things start to happen, don't worry, don't stew. Just go right along, you'll start happening too. Oh, the places you'll go. You'll be on your way up. You'll be seeing great sights. You'll join the high flyers who soar to high heights. You won't lag behind because you'll have the speed. You'll pass the whole gang and you'll soon take the lead. Wherever you fly, you'll be best of the best. Wherever you go, you will top all the rest. Except when you don't, because sometimes you won't. I'm sorry to say so, but sadly, it's true. That bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. You can get all hung up in a prickly perch, and your gang will fly on. You'll be left in a lurch. You'll come down from the lurch with an unpleasant bump, and the chances are, then, that you'll be in a slump. And when you're in a slump, you're not in for much fun. Unslumping yourself is not easily done. You will come to a place where the streets are not marked. Some windows are lighted, but mostly they're dark. A place you could sprain both your elbow and chin. Do you dare to stay out? Do you dare to go in? How much can you lose? How much can you win? And if you go in, should you turn left or right? Or right and three quarters? Or maybe not quite? Or go around back and sneak in from behind? Simple it's not, I'm afraid you will find. For a mind maker upper to make up his mind. You can get so confused that you'll start in to race. Down long wheeled roads at a breaknecking pace. And grind on for miles across weirdish wild space. Headed, I fear, toward a most useless place. The waiting place. For people just waiting. Waiting for a train to go, or a bus to come, or a plane to go, or the mail to come, or the rain to go, or the phone to ring, or the snow to snow, or waiting around for a yes or no, or waiting for their hair to grow. Everyone is just waiting. Waiting for the fish to bite, or waiting for wind to fly a kite, or waiting around for Friday night, or waiting, perhaps, for their Uncle Jake, or a pot to boil, or a better break, or a string of pearls, or a pair of pants, or a wig with curls, or another chance. Everyone is just waiting. No, that's not for you. Somehow you'll escape all that waiting and staying. You'll find the bright places where boom bands are playing. With banner flip flapping, once more you'll ride high. Ready for anything under the sky. Ready because you're that kind of a guy. Oh, the places you'll go. There is fun to be done. There are points to be scored. There are games to be won. And the magical thing you can do with that ball will make you the winningest winner of all. Fame! You'll be famous as famous can be. With the whole wide world watching, you win on TV. Except when they don't, because sometimes they won't. I'm afraid that sometimes you'll play lonely games too. Games you can't win, because you'll play against you. All alone. Whether you like it or not, alone will be something you'll be quite a lot. And when you're alone, there's a very good chance you'll meet things that scare you right out of your pants. There are some down the road between hither and yon that can scare you so much you won't want to go on. But on you will go, though the weather be foul. On you will go, though your enemies prowl. On you will go, though the hacking cracks howl. Onward up many a frightening creek, though your arms may get sore and your sneakers may leak. On and on you will hike. And I know you'll hike far and face up to your problems, whatever they are. You'll get mixed up, of course, as you already know. You'll get mixed up with many strange birds as you go. 
So be sure when you step, step with care and great tact. And remember that life's a great balancing act. Just never forget to be dexterous and deft and never mix up your right foot with your left. And will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed. Kid, you'll move mountains. So, be your name Boxbaum or Bixby or Bray or Medici, Allie, Van Allen, O'Shea. You're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting. So get on your way. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. One Fish, Two Fish, Red Fish, Blue Fish by Dr. Seuss. From here to here, from here to there, funny things are everywhere. One fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Black fish, blue fish, old fish, new fish. This one has a little star. This one has a little car. Say, what a lot of fish there are. Yes, some are red and some are blue. Some are old and some are new. Some are sad and some are glad. And some are very, very bad. Why are they sad and glad and bad? I do not know. Go ask your dad. Some are thin and some are fat. The fat one has a yellow hat. From there to here, from here to there, funny things are everywhere. Here are some who like to run. They run for fun in the hot, hot sun. Oh me, oh my, oh me, oh my. What a lot of funny things to go by. Some have two feet, and some have four. Some have six feet, and some have more. Where do they come from? I can't say, but I bet they have come a long, long way. We see them come, we see them go. Some are fast, and some are slow. Some are high, and some are low. Not one of them is like another. Don't ask us why, go ask your mother. Say, look at his fingers. One, two, three. Three. How many fingers do I see? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. He has eleven. Eleven. This is something new. I wish I had eleven too. Bump, bump, bump. Did you ever ride a wump? We have a wump with just one hump, but we know a man called Mr. Gump. Mr. Gump has a seven hump wump, so if you like to go bump, bump, just jump on the hump of the wump of a gump. Who am I? My name is Ned. I do not like my little bed. This is no good. This is not right. My feet stick out of bed all night. And when I pull them in, oh dear, my head sticks out of bed up here. We like our bike. It is made for three. Our mic sits up and back, you see. We like our mic, and this is why. Mike does all the work when the hills get high. Hello there, Ned. How do you do? Tell me, tell me, what is new? How are things in your little bed? What is new? Please tell me, Ned. I do not like this bed at all. A lot of things have come to call. A cow, a dog, a cat, a mouse. Oh, what a bed. Oh, what a house. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I cannot hear. Will you please come over near? Will you please look in my ear? There must be something there, I fear. Say, look, a bird was in your ear, but he is out, so have no fear. Again, your ear can hear, my dear. My hat is old. My teeth are gold. I have a bird I like to hold. My shoe is off. My foot is cold. My shoe is off. My foot is cold. I have a bird I like to hold. My hat is old. My teeth are gold. And now my story is all told. We took a look, we saw a nook. On his head, he had a hook. On his hook, he had a book. On his book was how to cook. We saw him sit and try to cook. He took a look at the book on the hook. But a nook can't read, so a nook can't cook. So what good to a nook is a hook cookbook? The moon was out, and we saw some sheep. We saw some sheep take a walk in their sleep. By the light of the moon, by the light of a star, they walked all night from near to far. I would never walk. I would take a car. I do not like this one so well. All he does is yell, yell, yell. I will not have this one about. When he comes in, I put him out. This one is quiet as a mouse. I like to have him in the house. At 
our house we open cans. We have to open many cans, and that is why we have a Zans. A Zans for cans is very good. Have you a Zans for cans? You should. I like to box. How I like to box. So every day I box a gox. In yellow socks I box my gox. I box in yellow gox box socks. It is fun to sing. If you sing with a ying, my ying can sing like anything. I sing high and my ying sings low. And we are not too bad, you know. This one, I think, is called a yink. He likes to wink. He likes to drink. He likes to drink and drink and drink. The thing he likes to drink is ink. The ink he likes to drink is pink. He likes to wink and drink pink ink. So if you have a lot of ink, then you should get a yink, I think. Hop, hop, hop. I am a yop. All I like to do is hop. From finger top to finger top. I hop from left to right and then hop, hop. I hop right back again. I like to hop all day and night. From right to left and left to right. Why do I like to hop, hop, hop? I do not know. Go ask your pop. Brush, 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 comb, 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 comb. Blue hair is fun to brush and comb. All girls who like to brush and comb should have a pet like this at home. Who is this pet? Say, he is wet. You never yet met a pet, I bet, as wet as they let this wet pet get. Did you ever fly a kite in bed? Did you ever walk with ten cats on your head? Did you ever milk this kind of cow? Well, we can do it. We know how. If you never did, you should. These things are fun and fun is good. Hello? Hello? Are you there? Hello? I called you up to say hello. I said hello. Can you hear me, Joe? Oh, no. I cannot hear your call. I cannot hear your call at all. This is not good and I know why. A mouse has cut the wire. Goodbye. From near to far, from here to there, funny things are everywhere. These yellow pets are called the Zeds. They have one hair upon their heads. Their hair grows fast, so fast they say. They need a haircut every day. Who am I? My name is Ish. On my hand I have a dish. I have this dish to help me wish. When I wish to make a wish, I wave my hand with a big swish swish. Then I say I wish for fish. And I get fish right on my dish. So, if you wish to wish a wish, you may swish for fish with my ish wish dish. At our house, we play out back. We play a game called Ring the Gack. Would you like to play this game? Come down. We have the only gack in town. Look what we found in the park, in the dark. We will take him home. We will call him Clark. He will live at our house. He will grow and grow. Will our mother like this? We don't know. And now, good night. It is time to sleep. So we will sleep with our pet Zeep. Today is gone. Today was fun. Tomorrow is another one. Every day from here to there, funny things are everywhere. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Dr. Seuss's ABC book. Big A, little A, what begins with A? Aunt Annie's alligator. A, A, A. Big B, little B, what begins with B? Barber, baby, bubbles, and a bumblebee. Big C, little C, what begins with C? Camel on the ceiling. C, C, C. Big D, little D, David Donald Do, dreamed a dozen donuts and a duck dog too. A, B, C, D, E, 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 ear, egg, elephant, E, E, E. Big F, little F, 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 four fluffy feathers on a fiffer, fiffer, feff. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, goat, girl, goo, goo, goggles, G, G, G. Big H, little H. Hungry horse, hay. Hen in a hat. Hooray, hooray. Big I, little I, 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 I. Ichabod is itchy, so am I. Big J, little J, what begins with J? Jerry Jordan's jelly jar and jam begin that way. Big K, little K, 
kitten, kangaroo, kick a kettle, kite, and a king's purr too. Big L, little L, little Lola Lop, left leg, lazy lion, licks a lollipop. Big M, little M, many mumbling mice are making midnight music in the moonlight. Mighty nice. Big N, little N, what begins with those? Nine new neckties and a nine shirt and a nose. O is very useful. You use it when you say, Oscar's only ostrich oiled an orange owl today. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P. Painting pink pajamas, policeman in a pail, Peter Pepper's puppy, and now Papa's in the pail. Big Q, little Q, what begins with Q? The quick queen of Quincy and her quacking quackaroo. Big R, little R, Rosie Robin Ross, Rosie's going riding on her red rhinoceros. Big S, little S, Silly Sammy Slick sipped six sodas and got sick, sick, sick. T, 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 T. What begins with T? Ten tired turtles on a tuttle, tuttle tree. Big U, little U, what begins with U? Uncle Ub's umbrella and his underwear too. Big V, little V. Vera Violet Vin is very, very, very awful on her violin. W, W, W. Willie Waterloo washes Warren Wiggins, who is washing Waldo Woo. X is very useful if your name is Nixie Knox. It also comes in handy spelling X and extra fox. Big Y, little Y, a yawning yellow yak. Young Yolanda Jorgensen is yelling on his back. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. Big Z, little Z, what begins with Z? I do. I am a zizzer zazzer zuz, as you can plainly see. Thanks for watching! Click subscribe! Green Eggs and Ham by Dr. Seuss I am Sam. I am Sam. Sam I am. That Sam I am. That Sam I am. I do not like that Sam I am. Do you like green eggs and ham? I do not like them, Sam I am. I do not like green eggs and ham. Would you like them here or there? I would not like them here or there. I would not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. Would you like them in a house? Would you like them with a mouse? I do not like them in a house. I do not like them with a mouse. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. Would you eat them in a box? Would you eat them with a fox? Not in a box. Not with a fox. Not in a house. Not with a mouse. I would not eat them here or there. I would not eat them anywhere. I would not eat green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. Would you? Could you? In a car? Eat them. Eat them. Here they are. I would not, could not in a car. You may like them, you will see. You may like them in a tree. I would not, could not in a tree, not in a car. You let me be. I do not like them in a box. I do not like them with a fox. I do not like them in a house. I do not like them with a mouse. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. A train, a train, a train, a train. Could you, would you, on a train? Not on a train. Not in a tree. Not in a car. Sam, let me be. I would not, could not in a box. I could not, would not with a fox. 
I will not eat them with a mouse. I will not eat them in a house. I will not eat them here or there. I will not eat them anywhere. I do not eat green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. Say, in the dark? Here, in the dark? Would you, could you, in the dark? I would not, could not, in the dark. Would you, could you, in the rain? I would not, could not, in the rain. Not in the dark, not on a train, not in a car, not in a tree. I do not like them, Sam, you see. Not in a house, not in a box, not with a mouse, not with a fox. I will not eat them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. You do not like green eggs and ham? I do not like them, Sam I am. Could you, would you, with a goat? I would not, could not, with a goat. Would you, could you, on a boat? I could not, would not, on a boat. I will not, will not, with a goat. I will not eat them in the rain. I will not eat them on a train. Not in the dark, not in a tree. Not in a car, you let me be. I do not like them in a box. I do not like them with a fox. I will not eat them in a house. I do not like them with a mouse. I do not like them here or there. I do not like them anywhere. I do not like green eggs and ham. I do not like them, Sam I am. You do not like them, so you say. Try them, try them, and you may. Try them and you may, I say. Sam, if you will let me be, I will try them, you will see. Say, I like green eggs and ham. I do. I like them, Sam I am, and I would eat them in a boat, and I would eat them with a goat. And I will eat them in the rain, and in the dark, and on a train, and in a car, and in a tree. They are so good, so good, you see. So I will eat them in a box, and I will eat them with a fox, and I will eat them in a house, and I will eat them with a mouse, and I will eat them here and there. Say, I will eat them anywhere. I do so like green eggs and ham. Thank you. Thank you, Sam I am. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Enemy Pie by Derek Munson. Illustrated by Tara Callahan King. It should have been a perfect summer. My dad helped me build a treehouse in our backyard. My sister was at camp for three whole weeks. And I was on the best baseball team in town. It should have been a perfect summer. But it wasn't. It was all good until Jeremy Ross moved into the neighborhood right next door to my best friend Stanley. I did not like Jeremy Ross. He laughed at me when he struck me out in baseball. He had a party on his trampoline and I wasn't even invited. But my best friend Stanley was. Jeremy Ross was the one and only person on my enemy list. I never even had an enemy list until he moved into the neighborhood. But as soon as he came along, I needed one. I hung it up in my treehouse where Jeremy Ross was not allowed to go. Dad understood stuff like enemies. He told me that when he was my age, he had enemies too. But he knew of a way to get rid of them. I asked him to tell me how. Tell you how? I'll show you how, he said. He pulled a really old recipe book off the kitchen shelf. Inside, there was a worn out scrap of paper with faded writing. Dad held it up and squinted at it. Ah, uh, enemy pie, he said, satisfied. You may be wondering what exactly is an enemy pie. I was wondering too. But Dad said the recipe was so secret, he couldn't even tell me. I decided it must be magic. I begged him to tell me something, anything. I will tell you this, he said. Enemy pie is the fastest known way to get rid of enemies. Now, of course, this got my mind working. What kinds of things, disgusting things, would I put into a pie for an enemy? I brought Dad some weeds from the garden, but he just shook his head. I brought him earthworms and rocks, but he didn't think he'd need those. I gave him the gum I'd been chewing on all morning. He gave it right back to me. I went out to play alone. I shot baskets until the ball got stuck on the roof. I threw a boomerang that never came back to me. And all the while, I listened to the sounds of my dad chopping and stirring and blending the ingredients of enemy pie. This could be a great summer 
after all. Enemy pie was going to be awful. I tried to imagine how horrible it must smell, or worse yet, what it would look like. But when I was in the backyard looking for ladybugs, I smelled something really, really, really good. And as far as I could tell, it was coming from our kitchen. I was a bit confused. I went in to ask Dad what was wrong. Enemy pie shouldn't smell this good. But Dad was smart. If enemy pie smelled bad, your enemy would never eat it, he said. I could tell he'd made enemy pie before. The buzzer rang, and Dad put on the oven mitts and pulled the pie out of the oven. It looked like plain, old pie. It looked good enough to eat. I was catching on. But still, I wasn't really sure how this enemy pie worked. What exactly did it do to enemies? Maybe it made their hair fall out, or their breath stinky. Maybe it made bullies cry. I asked Dad, but he was no help. He wouldn't tell me a thing. But while the pie cooled, he filled me in on my job. He talked quietly. There is one part of enemy pie that I can't do. In order for it to work, you need to spend a day with your enemy. Even worse, you have to be nice to him. It's not easy, but that's the only way that enemy pie can work. Are you sure you want to go through with this? Of course I was. It sounded horrible. It was scary, but it was worth a try. All I had to do was spend one day with Jeremy Ross. Then he'd be out of my hair for the rest of my life. I rode my bike to his house and knocked on the door. When Jeremy opened the door, he seemed surprised. He stood on the other side of the screen door and looked at me, waiting for me to say something. I was nervous. Can you play? I asked. He looked confused. I'll go ask my mom, he said. He came back with his shoes in his hand. His mom walked around the corner to say hello. You boys stay out of trouble, she said, smiling. We rode bikes for a while and played on the trampoline. Then we made some water balloons and threw them at the neighbor girls. But we missed. Jeremy's mom made us lunch. After lunch, we went over to my house. It was strange, but I was kind of having fun with my enemy. He almost seemed nice. But of course, I couldn't tell Dad that, since he had worked so hard to make his enemy pie. Jeremy Ross liked my basketball hoop. He said he wished he had a basketball hoop, but they didn't have room for one. I let him win a game, just to be nice. Jeremy Ross knew how to throw a boomerang. He threw it, and it came right back to him. I threw it, and it went over my house and into the backyard. When we climbed over the fence to find it, the first thing Jeremy noticed was my treehouse. My treehouse was my treehouse. I was the boss. If my sister wanted in, I didn't have to let her. If my dad wanted in, I didn't have to let him. And if Jeremy wanted in, can we go in it, he asked. I knew he was going to ask me that, but he was the top person, the only person on my enemy list, and enemies aren't allowed in my treehouse. But he did teach me to throw a boomerang, and he did have me over for lunch, and he did let me play on his trampoline. He wasn't being a very good enemy. Okay, I said, but hold on. I climbed up ahead of him and tore the enemy list off the wall. I had a checkerboard and some cards in the treehouse, and we played games until my dad called us down for dinner. We pretended we didn't hear him, and when he came out to get us, we tried to hide from him. But somehow he found us. Dad made us macaroni and cheese for dinner. My favorite. It was Jeremy's favorite, too. Maybe Jeremy Ross wasn't so bad after all. I was beginning to think that maybe we should just forget about enemy pie. But sure enough, after dinner... Dad brought out the pie. I watched as he cut the pie into eight thick slices. Dad, I said, it sure is nice having a new friend in the neighborhood. I was trying to get his attention and trying to tell him that Jeremy Ross was no longer my enemy. But Dad only smiled and nodded. I think he thought I was just pretending. Dad dished up three plates, side by side, the big pieces of pie and giant scoops of ice cream. He passed one to me and one to Jeremy. Wow, Jeremy said, looking at the pie. My dad never makes pie like this. It was at this point that I panicked. 
I didn't want Jeremy to eat enemy pie. He was my friend. I couldn't let him eat it. Jeremy, don't eat it. It's bad pie. I think it's poisonous or something. Jeremy's fork stopped before reaching his mouth. He crumpled his eyebrows and looked at me funny. I felt relieved. I had saved his life. I was a hero. If it's so bad, Jeremy asked, then why has your dad already eaten half of it? I turned to look at my dad. Sure enough, he was eating enemy pie. Good stuff, he mumbled through a mouthful. And that was all he said. I sat there watching them eat enemy pie for a few seconds. Dad was laughing. Jeremy was happily eating. And neither of them was losing any hair. It seemed safe enough, so I took a tiny taste. Enemy pie was delicious. After dessert, Jeremy rode his bike home, but not before inviting me over to play on his trampoline in the morning. He said he'd teach me how to flip. As for enemy pie, I still don't know how to make it. I still wonder if enemies really do hate it, or if their hair falls out, or their breath turns bad. But I don't know if I'll ever get an answer, because I just lost my best enemy. Thanks for watching! Click subscribe! From the World of New York Times bestseller, Good Night, Good Night Construction Site. Construction Site, Farming Strong, All Year Long, by Sherry Dusky Rinker and Ag Ford. It's early spring, the day's begun, as six tough trucks rise with the sun. They roll through mud and spots of snow, and look down at a farm below. Big tractor revs and greets the crew. Vroom! And pickup truck says, hi there, too. Beep, beep. In spring, the farm's a busy place. There's work to do, no time to waste. A springtime washout cracked a road, so dozer fills it load by load. Then dump truck hauls debris away. The trucks are working hard today. To get the fields ready now, big tractor pulls a chisel plow. She churns the soil, rips up weeds, prepares the ground for planting seeds. Little tractor plants the crop. She rolls along as big seeds drop from her planter, row by row, and pretty soon the corn will grow. Little skid steers doing chores, fixing pens and clearing floors. The cows and horses supervise the little truck that's just their size. Chicks and chickens peck and peep while a lamb and mother sheep are snuggled up and sound asleep. Summertime brings heat and sun, and lots of work needs to be done. Sunshine and care all season long help crops grow healthy, tall, and strong. A welcome rain shower passes through. The thirsty crops need water, too. After hay and wheat are cut, the balers help to roll them up. Then the bales dry in the sun. They'll be hauled in when they're all done. Hay for food and straw for beds, so every creature's warm and fed. Excavator lifts loads of ground. Bulldozer pushes dirt around. Skid steer makes her auger spin when she revs and digs right in. As crane truck sets the posts and beams, dump truck hauls to help the team. Cement mixer churning wet concrete fills the post holes nice and neat. And then he rolls around to pour a smooth and sturdy concrete floor. Then, Skid Steer puts in all the stalls. The cows come in as nighttime falls. The day's been filled with work and fun. And now, the brand new barn is done! The days grow cooler, crops grow tall. Summertime has turned to fall. Here is Combine, strong and proud. She comes out rumbling, huge and loud. She rolls on hills and through the fields, harvesting what each row yields. Tractor pulls grain carts behind. She rolls with combine all aligned. Auger lifts the grain up high and tractor catches on the fly. On hilly highways, up and down, semi-trucks take grain to town. Pickup truck is everywhere, carrying things from here to there. He helps wherever there's a need, hauling tools or straw or feed. No job's too little or too big. Look, now he's carrying a pig. There's just one last crop to bring in. The pumpkin harvest can begin. 
loader lifts, then pumpkins fly. For pumpkin carving, pumpkin pie, she harvests each and every one from dawn to dusk, and then she's done. Winter comes, and strong winds blow. Bulldozer clears away the snow, and mighty crane truck is on site to fix the roof and seal it tight. Dump truck's hauling things away. Excavator brings in hay, and skid steer's loading swift and sure. Her forklift holds the bale secure. The animals are safe and warm. The barn is snug against the storm. The year is coming to an end for all these strong, hard-working friends. A year of awesome work and play, of revving hard day after day, of tending animals with care, of crops to markets everywhere. Now off to rest with thoughts of thanks for good farm life and for full fuel tanks, for friends they have and work they do, for sunshine, rain, and crops that grew. All set for springtime days ahead, but now it's nighttime, time for bed. Good night, falling quilts of snow. Good night, cozy farm below. Good night, hardworking farming teams. It's been a good year. Now, shh, sweet dreams. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Thomas and Friends, Henry and the Elephant. Based on the Railway Series by Reverend W. Audrey. Illustrated by Richard Courtney. Thomas left the yard. He went to run his own branch line. Henry and Gordon missed Thomas. With Thomas gone, there was more work to do. Henry and Gordon were cross. Henry grumbled as he pushed trucks. Gordon grumbled as he pulled coaches. One day, a circus came to town. Now the engines were even busier. Henry pushed the trucks. Gordon pulled the coaches. They did not grumble. Henry and Gordon liked the circus. The next day, Henry took workmen to a blocked tunnel. The workmen picked up their tools. Time to clear the line. They walked inside. Something big was in the tunnel. It would not move. It grunted. It was alive. They ran outside. The foreman had a plan. Henry could push trucks into the tunnel. Whoosh, said Henry. Henry did not like tunnels. He was scared. Henry pushed the trucks. They went into the dark tunnel. Bump. Henry pushed hard. The big, scary thing pushed back. Henry pushed harder. The big, scary thing pushed hardest. Henry inched backwards. First, Henry was pushed out of the tunnel. Then, the trucks were pushed out. At last, they saw what was in the tunnel. It was an elephant, and he looked cross. He had run away from the circus. The workmen fed him and gave him lots of water. The elephant felt better. Henry felt better, too. He let off steam. Whoosh! Henry's steam scared the elephant. Splash! Poor Henry. It was time to go home. Everyone laughed at Henry. An elephant pushed me and splashed me, Henry grumbled. But in the shed, Henry told his funny story. His friends laughed. This time, Henry laughed, too. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Thomas and Friends, Hero of the Rails. Illustrated by Tommy Stubbs. Created by Britt Allcroft. Thomas was enjoying a quiet summer day until Spencer raced by with a whoosh. Spencer was visiting Sodor to help build a summer house for the Duke and Duchess of Boxford. Spencer thought he was better and faster than all the other engines, so Thomas challenged him to a race. Ready, set, go! Thomas and Spencer sped along the rails and raced around Sodor. Up and down hills, faster and faster they went. Suddenly, Thomas's brakes broke. He crashed through some bushes and made an incredible discovery. Thomas found an old engine in need of repair. The engine's name was Hero, 
and he had come from a distant island a long time ago. Hira was once called the master of the railway. Hira was afraid he'd be sent to the scrapyard because he wasn't really useful anymore. Thomas promised to repair him in secret and make him good as new. Thomas found some spare parts at the bustling Sodor Steamworks. These will help Hero, he peeped excitedly. But as he was on his way to visit Hero, Thomas learned something terrible. The Duke and Duchess of Boxford's summer house is right next to Hero's hiding place, Thomas peeped. Spencer will be here every day. Thomas knew he would have to be careful, or Spencer would discover Hero. Just then, Spencer steamed around the bend. I think you're up to something sneaky, he puffed. Thomas didn't answer. He just chuffed away nervously. Thomas couldn't do his work and repair Hero on his own. He needed help. So he went to Percy and told him everything. Of course I'll help, Percy peeped. What can I do? So Percy hid his mail cars and helped Thomas with his work. But the loads were too heavy for Percy. He soon popped a valve and needed to be repaired at the steamworks. Sir Topham Hat was very cross that Percy was doing Thomas's work. Thomas didn't tell Sir Topham Hat about Hero, but he did tell the other engines because he knew he needed their help too. Spencer wanted to know Thomas's secret, so he followed him everywhere. Thomas made sure to lead Spencer as far from Hero as possible. He even went out to the quarry where Spencer had a dusty accident. Meanwhile, all the other engines helped Hero. They were amazed by his stories about his distant home. Hero liked his new friends, but he missed his old friends. A few days later, Hero was almost as good as new. He just needed Percy to bring one last part. But while Hero and Thomas waited, Spencer huffed along the track. I knew you were up to something sneaky, Spencer puffed. Hero tried to race away, but without his last part, he sputtered to a stop. As Spencer chuffed off, he laughed and said he would tell Sir Topham Hat that the pile of scrap metal was ready for the smelting yard. Thomas knew he had to get to Sir Topham Hat first. He and Spencer roared through the tunnels and rushed around bends. It was the race of their lives. Spencer was too heavy for the old track that crossed the marsh. With a creak and a crash, he splashed into the water. Thomas sped to Knapford Station and told Sir Topham Hat everything. You have found the master of the railway? We must help Hero at once, Sir Topham Hat exclaimed. After a visit to the Sodor Steamworks, Hero was as good as new. Thomas and Percy couldn't believe their eyes. They blew their whistles happily. Later, Rocky, Thomas, and Hero pulled Spencer from the mud. But only Hero was mighty enough to pull Spencer all the way back to the Steamworks. Spencer said he was sorry for being so mean to everyone. Spencer, Thomas, and Hero finished the Duke and Duchess's summer house together. Hero liked his friends on Sodor, but he was still feeling very homesick. Thomas knew Sir Topham Hat could help. It was time for Hero to go home. All the engines gathered at Brendam Docks to say goodbye to their friend, the master of the railway. Thanks for watching! Click subscribe! How to Catch a Dinosaur From the New York Times bestselling author and illustrator Adam Wallace and Andy Elkerton Tomorrow's the big science fair. I've never won before, but this year I know I cannot lose because I'm catching a dinosaur. The crocs and sharks we know today were here when the dinosaurs ruled. It makes no sense. All dinos are gone. On this point, I cannot be fooled. We head straight to our local park to pick up some kind of trail. Wait, what's that thing over there? Yes, I think it's a dinosaur tail. The dino is more bird than reptile. We learned in science class that's true. And this one left something behind. I've got our first dinosaur clue. Snap, bird seed. Looks like we've got a plant eater. The Venus flytrap had no chance. She danced right by our volcano and knew the exit at first glance. Chomp! This clever girl runs fast as the wind and dodged our trap in a hurry. But we've got more in store for her, so this is no time to worry.
Dinosaurs swim for free. Was she watching when I tested each trap with my action figures and toy bricks? It's like she knows how each trap works. Can it be she's onto my tricks? Well, that didn't go according to plan. She slipped right past our noses. And if that isn't bad enough, I ruined Mom's prize-winning roses. We made a prehistoric playground. And with lots of friends to play, our dino won't be able to resist. This time, she won't get away. Tall enough to stop a giant, our trap had pulleys, ropes, and decks. But this dino smashed it all to pieces. She should be called T-Rex. My mom is an engineer, so I've learned a trick or three. Our Robo Hugger 9000 won't let our dino go free. That clever dino tricked our robot by dressing like a bird. If I don't catch the dinosaur soon, I'll be lucky to come in third. We didn't catch the dinosaur. I don't know what to do. But my friends remind me we still have a science fair entry or two. We did it! Better luck next time. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Kindness is Cooler, Mrs. Ruler. Written by Marjorie Kyler. Illustrated by Sachiko Yashikawa. It was cold. It was rainy. And Mrs. Ruler's class hadn't been outside all week. The students were getting jumpy and grumpy. Anaya and Tawana whispered during story time. David pulled Rakulita's ponytail, and Rakulita stole his hat. Then David grabbed Connor's hat and threw it into the hall. That's enough! Too rough! shouted Mrs. Ruler. The bell rang. It was time for recess. As the kids left, Mrs. Ruler kept Anaya, Tawana, Connor, Rakulita, and David behind. Sit down. Don't frown, she said. Now, tell me why do you think I've kept you in from recess? We were acting up, mumbled Connor. That's right. You were being mean to one another, and you acted as if it's cool to be mean. But it's not. What is a cooler way to act? Rakulita spoke up. Kindness is cooler, Mrs. Ruler, she said. Bravo. A slice of nice makes a mile of smile. You five need to practice being kind. During the next few days, I want you to perform five acts of kindness for your families. Then, in show and tell, you can share what you did with the rest of the class. David scowled. What if I don't feel like being kind? He asked. Mrs. Ruler smiled. Good deeds, fill needs, count on me, you'll see, she said. The next day, Anaya and Tawana couldn't wait for show and tell. When it was their turn, they ran to the front of the class. We did ten acts of kindness last night, said Tawana. Before dinner, I made special place mats. I set the table, said Anaya. I drew hearts on the napkins to show Mom we love her, said Tawana. I grated the cheese for the macaroni, said Anaya. I helped make the salad, said Tawana. After dinner, we carried the dishes to the sink, said Anaya. And I loaded the dishwasher, said Tawana. While I took out the garbage, added Anaya. Then I sponged off the table, said Tawana. And I straightened up the chairs, finished Anaya. Mom told us how much she liked our homework. It puts her in such a good mood that we want to do more nice things for her. Bravo, said Mrs. Ruler. Ten kind acts will lead to more. Give me the chalk and I'll keep score. Then she wrote the twins' deeds on the blackboard. When she was finished, she looked at David. What about you, she asked. Did you practice too? No said David. I just couldn't get into it. Oh my, please try. Kindness is cooler, said Mrs. Ruler. After school, Rapalita invited Connor over for a play date. She had a new dog and a big family, so there were lots of ways Rapalita and Connor could practice being kind. In show and tell the next day, they shared kindness with the class. We took puddles for a walk, said Rapalita, and we threw him a ball. I filled his water dish, said Connor. And I gave him some puppy chow, said Rockwellita. Puppy
Happy Chow? Wow, said Mrs. Ruler. Then we built a block tower with my little brother, said Raquelita, and gave Abuelo and Abuelita their canes before they took a walk. We also helped Raquelita's dad carry in groceries from the car, said Connor. And I gave my baby sister her bottle, said Raquelita. I count eight, and eight is great, said Mrs. Ruler. That's not all, said Connor. When I got home, I took in the mail. I also carried the clean laundry upstairs. Bravo, said Mrs. Ruler. All together, you did ten. And how much do the twins' ten acts? And your ten make? Twenty, shouted the class. That's right, said Mrs. Ruler. Twenty is plenty. But how about you, David? What did you do? Too few for you, said David. The class laughed. I told my brother I liked his haircut. And I'll let him use my comb. That's all I could think of. Well, that's a good start. Keep doing your part, said Mrs. Ruler. Lauren raised her hand. I'd like to try some acts of kindness when I get home today, too, she said. Okay, hooray, said Mrs. Ruler. Let's turn this into a class project. For the rest of the week, I'd like you to bring in some acts of kindness you've done at home. I'll write your acts on paper hearts and put them on the bulletin board. And I'll also add the ones from the blackboard. More acts of kindness. Put away clothes, vacuumed living room rug, shelved books, let my big brother use my computer, Told Dad I liked his shirt. Got Sister a band-aid when she skinned her knee. And more kindness. Cleaned my room. Fed goldfish. Emptied waste baskets. Watered houseplants. Put groceries away. Drew pictures with my little sister. Told my sister that she has nice teeth. The class really came through. We have so many, we'll need another wall, Mrs. Ruler exclaimed. Let's count. One, two, three... The kids counted until they reached 35. Bravo, said their teacher. Now try skip counting by fives. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, shouted the class. That's right. You're bright, said Mrs. Ruler. We should keep going with this project. Now let's try some acts of kindness at school. I'll add those to the wall too. Don't forget, a slice of nice makes a mile of smile. As Mrs. Ruler kept cutting out more hearts, Connor and Pablo tried some school kindness too. They invited David to sit with them at lunch. But when they finished their sandwiches, David took one of Connor's cookies. Hey, quit it, said Connor. He grabbed David's lunch and threw it over his head. Stop, cried Pablo. Don't you remember what Mrs. Ruler said? Good deeds fill needs. David, don't grab. And Connor, you still have four cookies. Why don't you share them with David and me? Oops, said Connor. You're right. For a moment, I forgot about being kind. And Connor gave some cookies to his friends. I agree. Here are three. Yum, said David. I'm going to ask my babysitter to help me make cookies when I get home. And then you can bring them to school, said Pablo, and share them with the whole class, added Connor. And Mrs. Ruler will congratulate me for being extra kind, said David. But I still won't have done as many acts of kindness as everyone else. So think of other things to catch up, said Pablo. David didn't have to think for long. That afternoon, when Caitlin was cleaning the gerbil's cage, the gerbils got loose. One even jumped to the window ledge. Mrs. Ruler hopped on a chair. Eek! Squeak! She cried. Everyone ran for cover. Everyone but David. He chased the gerbils. He scooped them up one by one. Then he set them back where they belonged. Hooray for David, yelled the class. Your act of kindness was the best, cried Mrs. Ruler. Now go on home and do the rest. She jumped off the chair and added the acts of kindness from that week to the wall. Mrs. Ruler and the class counted up all the hearts. By now, the class had done 70 acts of kindness. That's great, but wait, said Mrs. Ruler. There's more in store. Let's keep going and spread some kindness beyond school. There are lots of kind acts you can do in the community. But we're just little kids, said David. How can we do stuff outside our house and school? I'll ask your parents to work with you on community kindness, and I'll help too, said Mrs. Ruler. All it takes is one simple act, one act of kindness that will make the world a better place. 
If you act from your heart and do your part, we'll end up with 100 acts of kindness all together. Now the class was really excited, and David was more excited than anyone. A few weeks later, the kids shared their acts of community kindness. Mrs. Ruler added more hearts to the wall. Again, the class counted. One, two, three, until they got to 99. Oh no, uh-oh, said Mrs. Ruler. We still need one more. Then she paused and thought for a moment. I know, let's have a class party. We'll decorate and celebrate 100 acts of kindness, shouted the class. Okay, hooray! Thanks for watching! Click subscribe! Little Owl Snow by Divya Srinivasan A chill cut through the forest. Little Owl fluffed his feathers. Something is happening, he thought. Green leaves turned orange, gold, and brown, and then began to fall. Geese flew off to warmer places, navigating by starlight and honking all the way. Dry fallen leaves rustled and crackled as animals scurried, preparing for the cold. Bear was eating all day and into the night. Winter's almost here, Little Owl said. Isn't it exciting? Winter's too cold, Bear shuddered. I'm staying in. Bear sleeps through all the fun, Raccoon whispered. You'll see. Bats disappeared into a cave. Caterpillars closed up their cocoons. Goodbye, Hedgehog called. See you in spring. And he wiggled into his warm winter home. Little Owl thought he saw a moth. But it was only a leaf in the wind. The forest felt so empty now. <sighs> the friends were making fog when it happened. Snow! Soon the forest was blanketed in snow, its crystals glinting in the light. Tracks began to appear. Not everyone was hidden away. Little Owl hopped atop the frozen pond, watching fish swimming underneath. How strange and wonderful it all was! But one night, Little Owl started to miss Hedgehog. Mama, Little Owl asked, how much longer till spring? Snow is like a special secret not everyone can know, Mama said. Are you ready for it to melt away so soon? The forest was very quiet. Little Owl could hear the smallest sounds. Tap, tap. An icicle dripped onto a patch of slush. Mama told Little Owl he would see fireflies again. He would see Hedgehog too, soon enough. Right now, though, it was time to enjoy the snow. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Thomas and Friends Lost at Sea. Illustrated by Tommy Stubbs. Created by Britt Alcroft. It was a beautiful day on the island of Sodor, and Thomas was very busy. A new search and rescue center was being built, and there was a lot of work to do. The rescue center would be a place to help people in trouble. Plus, Harold would have a new landing pad. Captain would get a dock. And Rocky would finally get his own shed. The search and rescue center will be made of the strongest wood of all. Joby wood, said Sir Topham Hat. It will arrive today at Brendam Docks. Diesel wanted to show off and move all the Joby wood by himself. But when he did, the flatbeds holding the wood skipped off the track and over a steep cliff. Thomas saved Diesel, but all the wood splashed into the ocean below. As a reward, Thomas was given the job of going to the mainland to get more Joby wood. But the next day, the dock manager told him there was no room on the steamboat. Then Thomas saw a raft. The ship could pull me on that. Thomas puffed. The engines whistled and wished farewell to Thomas. He peeped goodbye to them. 
Then, with a long, low hoot of its horn, the big steamboat set out to sea, pulling Thomas on the raft. Thomas was far out at sea when darkness started to fall. Suddenly, he heard a creak and felt the raft lurch, fizzling fireboxes. He peeped. The chain to the steamboat has snapped. Nobody heard Thomas whistle and peep for help as the steamboat chugged away. Waves rocked the raft. Mist gathered around him. Thomas was alone and very, very worried. How will I get home? Thomas wondered. The next morning, Thomas found himself on a strange island. It was misty and quiet, and he didn't see any other engines. There must be a big dock in some ships, he said to himself. If I find them, I can sail back to Sodor. Thomas searched all over the island. He found many twisty tracks and thick, scratchy bushes. There was even a tunnel through an old fallen tree. But he didn't find a dock or anyone who could help him. Meanwhile, on Sodor, Sir Topham Hatt learned that Thomas was missing. Everyone stopped working on the search and rescue center and started looking for their lost friend. Sir Topham Hatt and Captain raced out to sea. The engines searched all over Sodor, and Harold took to the sky. Thomas was beginning to worry that he wouldn't find anyone to help him when he met three engines named Bash, Dash, and Ferdinand. They worked in an old logging camp. We're the logging locos, puffed Dash. You're on Misty Island, huffed Bash. Then Thomas made an incredible discovery. Bumpers and buffers, these are jumpy logs. That's the wood we need to build the Sodor Search and Rescue Center. Thomas told the logging locos about the rescue center. They agreed to help him load the wood. But Bash, Dash, and Ferdinand liked playing games more than they liked loading logs. And they really loved bouncing on the wibbly-wobbly shake-shake bridge. Thomas definitely did not enjoy bouncing on the bridge. Oh, Weezy, the giant log loader, wasn't much help either. He wanted to throw wood instead of stacking it. Thomas thought the work would never get done. But after a day of biffing and bashing, the Joby wood was ready to go. Now how will I get these logs back to Sodor? Thomas peeped. Luckily, Bash knew a way. Bash told Thomas about a dangerous old tunnel that connected Misty Island to Sodor. I know all about tunnels, Thomas puffed. It won't be dangerous. So, pushing their flatbeds, the logging locos followed Thomas into the dark and twisty tunnel. Suddenly, there was trouble. Boom! Crash! Rocks tumbled down around the engines. The tracks were blocked. Thomas and the logging locos were trapped. I feel air on my funnel, Ferdinand peeped. Dash spotted a hole in the roof of the tunnel. Huff your hardest, he said to Thomas. Someone will see your steam. Thomas thought that was an excellent idea and excitedly started puffing. Back at Brendam Docks, Percy saw three puffs of steam in the sky. His firebox fizzed. It's Thomas! Percy peeped to Whiff. He's on Misty Island. Whiff knew about an old tunnel that led to Misty Island. Follow me, he puffed. Percy and Whiff raced through the tunnel and found the cave-in. Watch out, Thomas! Whiff huffed. Percy and I are going to push through the rocks. With that, Percy and Whiff rocked and rolled and pumped their pistons. Then they crashed through the rocks. Thomas and the logging locos were saved. Sir Topham Hatt was very happy that Thomas and his new friends were safe. And with all that new Joby wood, the rescue center would be finished in no time. Today is a special day made possible by very special engines, Sir Topham Hatt announced. At the opening of the search and rescue center, all the engines peeped and Thomas's pistons pumped with pride. Thanks for watching! Click subscribe! Thomas and Friends Misty Island Rescue Illustrated by Tommy Stubbs Based on the railway series by the Reverend W. Audrey Created by Britt Alcroft it was an exciting day on the island of Sodor. Construction was nearly complete on the new search and rescue center, which would help people in trouble. There would be a new helipad for Harold, and Rocky was getting his own shed, so there was much work to do. It will be 
made of the strongest wood of all. Joby wood, Sir Topham Hat told Thomas and the other engines. The wood will arrive today at Brendam Docks, the most useful engine. At the end of the day, we'll get to pull the Joby logs to the search and rescue center. Thomas went quickly to work. Diesel wanted to show off, so with a biff and a bash, he shunted all the Joby wood away from the docks. Stop! Thomas puffed, his boiler bubbling. Diesel only went faster and faster. Unfortunately, the heavy flatbeds holding the wood jumped off the track and pulled Diesel toward the edge of a steep cliff. Thomas wasted no time pulling Diesel back to safety, but all the rich red wood tumbled into the sea. Sir Topham Hatt was very pleased with Thomas. You made the right decision to pull Diesel back. You didn't wait to be asked or to be told. As a reward, Thomas would visit the mainland and bring back more Joby wood. The next day, while Thomas waited to be loaded onto a ship, Salty told him and Percy about Misty Island. It's a mysterious place, Salty huffed. Once, an engine was lost there. No one could find him because of the mist. If I were lost on Misty Island, Thomas peeped, I'd puff three times. I'd come save you, Percy promised. The dock manager informed Thomas that there was no room for him on the ship. Thomas would have to wait for the next boat. But then Thomas spotted a raft. The ship can pull me on that, Thomas puffed. Percy was worried that the raft wasn't safe. Don't worry, Sir Topham Hatt said I make the right decisions, assured Thomas. And with that, the ship set out for the mainland, pulling Thomas on a raft. When Thomas was far out at sea and darkness started to fall, he heard a creak and a crash. The chain to the steamship had snapped. Thomas whistled and wished as the big boat steamed away, but no one could hear him. The rocking waves carried Thomas into the misty night. The next morning, Thomas found himself on an unfamiliar island. It was quiet and very misty. As Thomas explored, he heard strange sounds. Rusty wheels rattled on old rails, and wild whistles echoed all around him. Thomas called out, but no one answered. Then, as Thomas rounded a bend, he made an amazing discovery. Thomas had come fender to fender with three of the strangest engines he'd ever seen. Cinders and ashes! peeped Thomas. Who are you? The strange engine's names were Bash, Dash, and Ferdinand. They told Thomas that he was on Misty Island. We're the Logging Locos, said Dash. We've been watching you since you first rolled onto the island. We played rattling wheels and whistling whistles with you, Bash said. You didn't play with us. You can now if you want. Thomas didn't want to play with Bash, Dash, and Ferdinand. Their games were strange. No, thank you. I have to get back to the island of Sodor. And with that, Thomas wished backwards down the track. Later, as the mist grew thicker and darkness fell, Thomas wasn't feeling so brave. He had chuffed and huffed all day, but he hadn't found a way off Misty Island. Thomas knew he would have to ask the logging logos for help. The next morning on Sodor, Sir Topham Hatt learned that Thomas was missing. Everyone wanted to help find Thomas. The engine searched all over Sodor. Harold took to the air. Sir Topham Hatt and Captain chugged out to sea. Thomas spent the day looking for the logging locos. Tracks crisped and crossed. They climbed into foggy mountains and dove into tangled forests. Then, overlooking a deep valley, Thomas discovered an old logging camp. Footplates and fenders, Thomas exclaimed. I found the logging locos. Bash, Dash, and Ferdinand were loading wood in the old logging camp. Thomas asked them for help, but they were busy. We said hello to you yesterday, Dash said, but you didn't want to be friends with us. I'm sorry, Thomas peeped. I was silly to think I could find a way off Misty Island by myself. Then Thomas realized something amazing. Bumpers and buffers! These logs are Joby logs! That's the wood we need to build the search and rescue center. The logging locos clanked closer together to listen as Thomas told them about the rescue center. They agreed to help him collect logs. Thomas showed the locos how quickly he could shunt flatbeds holding logs. One biff, one bash, 
and there's never a crash. We can't work this hard, said Dash. We'll run out of oil, said Bash. That's right, added Ferdinand. The logging locos weren't diesels, but they used wood and oil for fuel. I'm sure you have enough oil, Thomas reassured them. Sir Topham Hatch says I make good decisions. The engines busily hauled logs and shunted flatbeds, but when they came to a rickety old bridge, Thomas stopped. The logging locos liked bouncing on the wibbly-wobbly shake-shake bridge. Yippee! They cheered as they chugged across the quaking tracks. Thomas didn't like the bridge, but he knew he had to cross it to collect the joby wood. So, wobbly wheel by wobbly wheel, he crept slowly across. Everything shook, but nothing broke, and Thomas was proud of himself for being so bold and brave. Thomas needed to load the heavy logs onto flatbeds, but oh Weezy, the camp's giant log loader, wasn't much help. He liked throwing logs instead of loading them. He jiggled and joggled and spun. Logs flew here and there. They splashed in a pond and crashed into trees. One even bashed Thomas on the boiler. The locals cackled with laughter. Thomas needed a better way to load the joby wood. Luckily, he spotted an old machine. That's hee-haw, said Dash. He's the old log loading machine. He needs too much oil, Bash added. That's why we don't use him. Thomas wasn't worried. They poured the last of the oil into hee-haw. As the old machine creaked and sputtered into action, Thomas was very pleased. Soon, Thomas had three flatbeds full of joby logs. But he had no idea how to get them back to Sodor. We could use the tunnel, Dash suggested. Thomas was amazed. You didn't tell me there was a tunnel to Sodor, he peeped. That's because it's closed, Dash said. Because it's dangerous, Bash added. Thomas was too excited to listen. I know all about tunnels. It won't be dangerous. The engines wheezed and wished to the old tunnel. Dash stopped at the entrance. We locos don't have enough oil to puff to Sodor, he said. Of course you do, puffed Thomas as he pushed his flatbed into the tunnel. It's just a whir and a whiff and we'll be there. They all disappeared into the dark and twisty tunnel. Suddenly, there was trouble ahead. The tracks were blocked by rocks. Then, with a rumble and a crash, more rocks smashed down behind them. We can push the rocks out of the way, Thomas puffed. Bash, Dash, and Ferdinand bravely pumped their pistons, but with a gasp and a groan, they ran out of oil. They couldn't push any more. The engines were stuck in the tunnel, and no one knew where they were. Just then, Ferdinand noticed something. I feel air on my funnel, he peeped. Dash spotted a hole in the roof of the tunnel. Puff forward, Thomas, and huff your hardest, Bash suggested. Someone will see your steam. Thomas excitedly beamed from buffer to buffer and started to puff. Back at Brendam Docks, Percy saw something that made his firebox fizz. Three puffs of steam floated high in the distance. It's Thomas! Percy peeped. He's on Misty Island, and he needs help. Percy told Sir Topham Hat and all the engines about Thomas. Everyone was ready to help. James, Gordon, and Edward, you will sail to Misty Island with me, said Sir Topham Hat. Then Whiff suggested using the abandoned tunnel that led to Misty Island. It would be the fastest way to reach Thomas. Won't that be dark and dangerous? asked Sir Topham Hat. Don't worry, puffed Whiff. I know all the tracks. Meanwhile, Thomas and the logging locos were waiting in a dark tunnel. Soon, they heard a noise coming through the rocks. It was the clickety-clack of wheels on the tracks. Then, Thomas recognized Percy's friendly voice. Whiff and I have found you, Thomas, peeped Percy. Watch out, Thomas, Whiff puffed. Percy and I are going to push through the rocks to reach you. With that, Percy and Whiff rocked and rolled backwards together. Then they pumped their pistons and crashed through the rocks. Hooray for Percy, puffed Thomas. Hooray for Whiff. Thomas introduced Whiff and Percy to the logging locos. With a shove and a shunt, Whiff pulled the brave engines out of the tunnel. The logging locos wished and whooshed with wonder when they saw the sunny island of Sodor. Thomas helped the logging locos to the Sodor Steamworks for repairs. 
He knew that Kevin and Victor would make them good as new. Sir Topham Hat was excited to see that Thomas was safe, and that with all the Joby Wood Thomas had found on Misty Island, the rescue center would be finished in no time. Finally, the big day arrived. The Sodor Search and Rescue Center and the Misty Island Tunnel were officially opened. Today is a very special day, made possible by very special engines, Sir Topham Hat said as he cut a red ribbon with a giant pair of scissors. The people cheered and the engines peeped. Thomas, surrounded by his old and new friends, beamed with pride. Thanks for watching! Click subscribe! My School Stinks! Words by Becky Scharnhorst. Pictures by Julia Patton. August 31st. Dear Diary, tomorrow is the first day at my new school. Mom and Dad told me to take deep breaths and to think happy thoughts. So far, it isn't working. P.S. They also said I was old enough to walk to school by myself. Good thing I drew a map. September 1st. Dear Diary, I think there's been a mistake. My desk mate stinks. My locker buddy bites. And my teacher is unbearable. I told Mom my classmates are wild animals. But she said all little kids are wild animals. I think I'm going to be sick tomorrow. September 2nd. Dear Diary, Mom didn't believe I was sick. Neither did Dad. September 3rd. Dear Diary, there's definitely been a mistake. Today, the monkeys asked me to play during recess. It was fun until they let go. Patricia caught me, but I still had to visit the nurse. Here is one of the quills she pulled out. I have 186 more. Patricia. Ouch. P.S. The deep breaths still aren't working. P.P.S. Neither are the happy thoughts. P.P.P.S. I'm not going back tomorrow. September 4th. Dear Diary, I had to go back. Ms. Fuzzybottom is the only one who understands. September 5th. Three reasons why I hate Wildwood Elementary. Number one. Betsy chewed up all my pencils. Number two, George keeps picking through my hair, looking for bugs to eat. Number three, Charlie ate our science experiment. P.S. My school stinks. September 8th. Dear Diary, when I went to feed Miss Fuzzybottom, she was missing. I suspected Sammy, but he said he was still digesting his breakfast from last week. Maybe... It was Charlie. Nope. P.S. Charlie asked me to eat lunch with him tomorrow. What if I'm lunch? P.P.S. I asked Dad if he would pick me up before lunch. He said no. So did Mom. Dear Stuart, will you have lunch with me tomorrow? Charlie. September 9th. Dear Diary, today in gym, we ran relay races. My team finished in 4 hours, 27 minutes, and two seconds. We lost. Then I let Camilla go first at the water fountain. By the time I got back to class, everyone had already left. Good news. I missed lunch. Bad news. Charlie waited for me. I got so scared, I left without my homework. Mr. Grizzly is not going to be happy about that. September 10th. Dear Diary, Mr. Grizzly gave out class jobs today. I wanted to be line leader. But instead, I got closet cleaner. I found four dead cockroaches and gave them to Sammy for lunch. He said I could eat his dessert for the rest of the week because he wouldn't be hungry anyway. P.S. Maybe I should give one of the desserts to Charlie. He's always hungry. September 11th. Dear Diary, we ran races again today. This time, we won. P.S. I gave Charlie one of my cupcakes and he bit my finger. Nurse Molly said I only needed one bandage this time. Ouch! P.P.S. You can't get rabies from a crocodile. I asked. September 12th. Dear Diary, I found a note from Charlie. I'm sorry I bit your finger, 
I'm a nervous biter. Can we be friends? Maybe I should tell him about the deep breaths and happy thoughts. September 15th. Dear Diary, you'll never guess what happened. During lunch, the hyenas were laughing at my small teeth, but Charlie stood up for me. You should have seen them run when they saw his teeth. Later, he and Ralph helped me clean the closet. While we were in there, we heard a scary noise. Now we all smell really bad. P.S. Mom doesn't understand how a skunk got in the storage closet. I guess she'll find out at open house. Oops, sorry. <laughs> September 16th. Dear Diary, turns out that scary scratching noise was just Ms. Fuzzy Bottom. We threw her a welcome home party and gave her extra treats. But it seemed like she wanted to go back to the closet. Eek! September 17th. Three things I love about Wildwood Elementary. One, Betsy sharpens all my pencils. Two, George keeps me life free. Three, my best friend, Charlie. Wildwood Elementary. Open house. Deep breaths, Dad. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Nothing Fits a Dinosaur by Jonathan Fenske. No more playtime, says my mama. Take a bath, put on pajamas, and please, tonight, no dino drama. The bath is fun. I romp and stomp inside my tiny bathroom swamp. But finding jammies is a chore when nothing fits a dinosaur. These claws would tear a shirt in two. This cozy quilt will have to do. And pants cannot contain these thighs. Two sleeping bags are more my size. What kind of socks will warm these toes? Some pillowcases, I suppose. Why stop there? My feet could use a decent pair of stomping shoes. But these will barely fit a mouse. So let these buckets shake the house. And now my noggin needs a hat. A lampshade will take care of that. Did I forget my underwear? I have a tail. I hang it there. Now I am such a silly sight. A dressed up dino is not right. These clothes shall feel my dino might. Roar! I shed them with a mega roar. I kick them all across the floor. No shirt, no pants, no socks, no shoes. No hat, no underwear. I choose to dress in nothing. Look at me. Nothing fits me perfectly. Watch me romp and stomp and roar, a naked happy dinosaur. I run wild and I run free, as bare as dinosaurs should be. Till Mamasaurus roars at me, no more playtime, that is it! I better find some clothes that fit. Thanks for watching, click subscribe. One vote, two votes, I vote, you vote, by Bonnie Worth. Illustrated by Aristides Ruiz and Joe Matthew. Voting is something we do every day. It's a way we can choose that gives us our own say. We vote for class president and which snack to get, where to go on class trip, what to pick as class pet. Voting gives each of us our very own voice. It allows a large group to make one single choice. How do you vote? With a proudly raised hand, marks on paper, thumbs up or thumbs down. Understand? Can you choose not to vote? Yes, but that's a sure way to lose your own voice and to not have a say. The item or person that most of us select will wind up the winner, the one we elect. The biggest of all of America's voting events chooses our president and vice president. Are presidents important? Oh yes, they are. Very. They head up the government and the military. Vice presidents take over on the unhappy day when presidents get sick or else pass away. If 
every four years, we elect them, you see, because we live in a democracy. A government for the people and run by them too, which means that this country is governed by you. Every two years, we elect senators and congresspeople of our choice to make laws in Washington and be our state's voice. We also elect sheriffs and mayors and such. Do local elections count? You bet, just as much. When our founders drew up the Constitution, it's true. They said folks should vote, but they did not say who. Since then, our history is marked by brave fights waged by people who struggled to win voting rights for all of the races and for all womankind, and also for 18-year-olds. Bear in mind, that means that quite soon, you will get to vote too. So please pay attention. This matters to you. Voting rights timeline. 1870, 15th Amendment, black men can vote. 1920, 19th Amendment, women can vote. 1924, Citizenship Act, Native Americans can vote. 1971, 26th Amendment, 18-year-olds can vote. Only citizens can vote and, as you've just been told, people who are at least 18 years old, you must sign up in person or on the internet with name, address, and birthday, and one more thing yet. You can write down your party if you do not mind. Cakes and ice cream, you're thinking, is the party that kind? This kind of party, I'm here to report, is the kind that we know as the political sort. It's made up of large groups of citizens who share beliefs and ideas and opinions too. Democrats and Republicans are the biggest too, plus small parties to pick from, more than just a few. In primary elections, run before November, votes will be cast by each party member for the candidate who they hope and they pray will be on the ballot come election day. Candidates set out on the campaign trail to convince voters that they will not fail. A vote for me, the candidates say, will make your dreams come true someday. With speeches and ads and town hall meetings, with handshakes and waves and cheery greetings, they work to win the voters' trust. To win nomination, this is a must. I may be wrong, but it does seem to me that voting is one big responsibility. As a voter, you must follow news carefully. You should read, watch, and listen, and then try to see what the candidates, if elected, plan to do. What are their beliefs? Do they ring true for you? Debates are held for the people to see. The candidates talk on live TV. Moderators on hand have questions to ask. To give their best answer is the candidate's task. A debate is an argument that's meant to sway. It is run by rules in a most formal way. At meetings called rallies, supporters get out to cheer the candidate they care most about. Supporters on the phone or going door to door say, vote for my party on election day. They raise lots of money, collect change in jars, and sell campaign stickers to stick on cars. George Washington won the vote, so I have been told, during a winter that was snowy and cold. In 1845, Congress passed a vote to say there would be an earlier election day, November. The day each year is easy to remember. It's the Tuesday after the first Monday in November. This date was chosen for a very good reason. It came at the end of the harvesting season. When election day comes, the voters' big role is to make sure to vote at their assigned poll. A poll is where you vote. As a general rule, it is a public place, like a firehouse or school. If you're out of town, there's a chance that you might mail an absentee ballot. Voting is your right. People cast their votes by different means. Ballots fed into computers or direct voting machines. However you vote, it's important, you see, that voters are given complete privacy. A curtain or screen protects voters from view. This ensures that your vote is known only to you. The polls close up at the end of the day. Here come the counters. Please clear the way. By special computer, poll results are scanned, but some votes are still counted out by hand. The results are sent to the Board of Elections, which declares the winner after careful inspections. The loser admits their bitter defeat. The winner announces their victory sweet. The winner vows to serve everyone in the land, not just the supporters who lent them a hand. If all of this rings true, it is my dearest hope that you will cast your first vote for the cat in the hat. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Out.
Told by Ryan T. Higgins, a little Bruce book. It is wintertime in Soggy Hollow, and there are lots of fun things to do outside. But Bruce is not outside. He is inside with a cold. The mice are inside too. But not for long. It was so nice of Bruce to send us outside to play in the snow, says Nibs. The mice do all their favorite wintry things. Bruce would love making a snow family. Bruce would love skating. Bruce would love ski jumping. We miss Bruce. But the mice have an idea. They will bring the wintry fun inside to Bruce. Bruce, come look at what we made for you, says Nibs. Ta-da! Our snow family! Where did they go? Says Thistle. They were all right here. I think you are standing on Snow Bruce's eyebrow, says Rupert. Right this way, says Rupert. Let's enjoy the graceful art of ice skating. As you can see, we flooded the bathroom and left all the windows open so the floor can freeze into a skating rink. Wait! Come back! You need your skates! That's right, Bruce! Keep coming this way to try the ski jump! All that fun sure tuckered you out, Bruce. What Bruce really needs, says Nibs, is a cozy blanket and a hot drink. Feeling better, Bruce? Inside or outside, winter is a time for togetherness and sharing. Achoo! I'd rather be hibernating. The end. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Pete the Cat and the Missing Cupcakes by Kimberly and James Dean. Pete and Gus were as busy as could be. They were getting ready for the cupcake party. It started at three. They were making cupcakes for everyone. Pete and Gus counted them just for fun. They had ten when they were done. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Oh no! Hang on! Some of the cupcakes were gone. They were sure there had been ten. Pete said, maybe we need to count again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They counted the cupcakes lined up straight. Now there were only eight. It looks like someone had taken two. But who? Pete and Gus did not know what to do. Just then, they found a clue. Gus said, look what I have found. Sprinkles on the ground. I bet it was Squirrel. She loves sprinkles. Squirrel said, it wasn't me. It couldn't be. I've been at the spelling bee. Uh-oh. More cupcakes are missing. Come and see. One, two, three, four, five, six. This was too weird. Two more cupcakes had disappeared. Now there were only six. Someone must be playing tricks. But who? Pete and Gus did not know what to do. Just then, they found another clue. Pete said, I bet it was Alligator. He loves to eat. Alligator said, it wasn't me. It couldn't be. I've been learning my ABCs. Uh-oh. More cupcakes are missing. Come and see. One, two, three, four. Now there were only four. Someone had taken two more. But who? Pete and Gus did not know what to do. Just then, they found another clue. I bet it was Turtle, said Pete. I know Turtle loves sweets. Turtle said, it wasn't me. It couldn't be. I've been swimming in the sea. Uh-oh, more cupcakes are missing. Come and see. What on earth was going on? 
All the cupcakes were now gone. Pete and Gus did not know what to do. They started looking for another clue. They found Grumpy Toad with icing on his face. Pete and Gus had solved the case. I am so sorry. It was me. I could not stop with just one. I ate and ate till there were none. Everyone agreed. Grumpy Toad would have to miss the fun. He could not come after what he had done. Pete said, But oh, wait, Grumpy Toad made a mistake. This is true. Let's give him a second chance. That's what friends do. Pete told Grumpy Toad they would give him another chance. He was so excited, he did a happy dance. The night of the party was so much fun. Grumpy Toad brought more than enough cupcakes for everyone. Pete the Cat's Cupcake Party. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Pete the Cat, Crayons Rock by Kimberly and James Dean. Pete loves his big box of groovy crayons. He loves to draw things like cars, trucks, flowers, and trees. And most of all, the big blue sea. From Rockin' Red to Cool Cat Blue, with a box of crayons, there's nothing Pete can't do. One day, Pete decided to draw something new. His friends! Using lots of colors is so much fun. Pete wanted to use every one. He scribbled and drew a great big smile. His drawings were groovy and rockin' with style. Crayons rock! Pete was proud of the pictures he drew. He hoped his friends would dig them, too. Pete showed Grumpy Toad first. Grumpy Toad said, This doesn't look right. Those colors are way too bright. Pete thought, Hey, no sweat. That's all right. The next one will be dynamite. For Gus from Pete. Pete showed Gus his picture, too. Gus asked, Who is this supposed to be? It doesn't really look like me. Pete thought, hey, no sweat. That's all right. The next one will be just right. For Callie from Pete. Pete finally showed Callie her picture. Callie said, this one is fine, but it feels like something's missing from mine. Pete said, what a mess. Bummer. I guess my drawings aren't the best. Pete started to frown. He put his crayons down. In art class, the teacher asked, Pete, what are you going to make? I don't know. I'm afraid of making a mistake. Pete looked around. Gus drew the coolest superheroes. Callie's flowers were awesome, out of sight. Grumpy's motorcycle was just right. Pete's heart sank. His paper was blank. The gang looked at Pete and said, No sweat. It's all right. It doesn't have to be just right. Your art is cool because it's you. Your art is so unique. Grab your groovy box of crayons. Show us your technique. The teacher agreed. Art should be fun. Art is for everyone. From rockin' red to cool cat blue. With a box of crayons, there's nothing you can't do. Pete smiled. There are no rules. It's no big deal. Art is about how it makes you feel. Pete loved his cool art. That's the one thing Pete knew. Suddenly, Pete knew exactly what to do. He tried again. Instead of drawing them one by one, Pete drew the whole gang, just having fun. Wow, way to go, Pete. That's a rockin' masterpiece. Grumpy Toad, Gus, and Callie agreed. Pete's picture was off the charts. See, that's the groovy thing about art. The best art comes from the heart. Crayons rock. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Pete the Cat and the New Guy. Written by Kimberly and James Dean. It was Sunday, and Pete's friends had come to play. They were rocking to a new song when... Beep, beep, beep. There was a noise coming from across the street. 
wise old owl had a view from his tree. Pete said, hey owl, what do you see? Owl said, all I see are green shoes and a red hat. Pete answered, sounds like my kind of cat. Pete could not imagine who this new guy could be. I really hope it's a new friend for me. On Monday, Pete wanted to say hi, but he was feeling kind of shy. So he just rode by and by and by and by until finally Pete got to meet the new guy. Pete said, I've never met anyone quite like you. You seem like a duck and like a beaver too. The new guy said to Pete, Hi, my name is Gus. Glad to meet you. I'm a platypus. Pete said, You're not like me, and I am not like you. But I think being different is really very cool. On Tuesday, Pete and Gus took a walk down the street. They came to Squirrel, who was playing in a tree. Hi, Gus, said Squirrel. Climbing is easy. Try and see. Gus gave the tree a try, but the branch was way too high. I wish I could climb like you, but climbing is something I just can't do. Pete said, don't be sad, don't be blue. There is something everyone can do. On Wednesday, Pete and Gus took a walk down the street. They came to Pete's friend, Grumpy Toad, who said, come play, leapfrog with me. Jumping is easy, try and see. Gus jumped and leaped, but he couldn't get over Toad or Pete. I wish I could jump like you, but jumping is something I just can't do. Pete said, don't be sad, don't be blue. There is something everyone can do. On Thursday, Pete and Gus took a walk down the street. Soon they saw Octopus who said, come juggle with me. Juggling is easy, try and see. I wish I could juggle like you, but juggling is something I just can't do. Pete said, don't be sad, don't be blue. There is something everyone can do. On Friday, Pete and Gus took a walk down the street. Gus said, I can't juggle or jump or climb a tree. It's no fun around here for me. On Saturday, Pete hoped Gus would come out to play. I wish Gus wasn't sad. I wish Gus wasn't blue. I wish there was something we could do. Just then, Pete heard a groovy sound. It was coming from across the street. Gus was rocking to his own beat. Sweet! Pete said, check out Gus the platypus. He found something cool he can do with us. Tap, thump, thump. Thump, thump, tap, tap. He's not sad, he's not blue. Gus found something that everyone can do. Thanks for watching! Click subscribe! Pete the Cat, Scuba Cat by James Dean Pete the Cat is excited. He is going scuba diving! Pete puts on a mask and fins. He has a tank full of air. He hopes to see lots of fish. If you are lucky, you might see a seahorse, says Captain Joe. A seahorse? says Pete. I can't wait. I never saw one before. Their ridges look like a horse's mane, says Captain Joe. Groovy, says Pete. Pete jumps into the water. Splash. Down, down, down he goes. Up, up, up go the bubbles. Pete looks for a seahorse. He sees a swordfish. Pete swims out of its way. Pete waves to a stingray. It has a long, skinny tail. That's not a seahorse, thinks Pete. Pete looks high and low for the seahorse. Then he feels a tickle. Pete sees a school of fish. They all look alike, except for one. It puffs up. It is a blowfish. It is not a seahorse. Where could one be? Pete looks in the rocks. What is that? It is an octopus. It has eight legs. It is not a seahorse. Pete feels a tickle. What could it be? Pete turns. He sees a cave. Is there a seahorse inside? Pete sees a crab with claws. 
A seahorse does not have claws, Pete thinks. The cave is getting darker. Pete feels a tickle. Then he sees an eel. Pete swims past it. It is too long to be a seahorse. Oh no, it is too dark to see. How will Pete get out? Pete sees a jellyfish. It glows in the dark. Pete is almost out of the cave. He sees an angelfish. It is very colorful. Pete is out of the cave. So why is it so dark? Pete is in a shadow. He is in the shadow of a whale. Yikes! Pete wishes he could jump on a seahorse and ride away. Pete hops on a sea turtle instead. It takes him to the boat. I did not see a seahorse, thinks Pete. He feels a little tickle on his tail. A seahorse, cries Pete. What a surprise. You were with me all along, says Pete. What a cool adventure. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Pete the Cat Rocking in My School's Shoes Art by James Dean, creator of Pete the Cat Story by Eric Litwin Here comes Pete, strolling down the street Rocking red shoes on his four furry feet Pete is going to school And he sings this song I'm rocking in my school shoes I'm rocking in my school shoes I'm rocking in my school shoes Pete is sitting at his desk when his teacher says, Come on, Pete, down that hall to a room with books on every wall. Where is Pete going? The library. Pete has never been to the library before. Does Pete worry? Goodness no. He finds his favorite book and sings his song. I'm reading in my school shoes. I'm reading in my school shoes. I'm reading in my school shoes. Check out Pete. He's ready to eat in a big noisy room with tables and seats. Where is Pete? The lunchroom! It can be loud and busy in the lunchroom. Does Pete worry? Goodness no! He sits down with his friends and sings his song. I'm eating in my school shoes. I'm eating in my school shoes. I'm eating in my school shoes. Pete and his friends are playing outside on a green grassy field with swings and tall slides. Where is Pete? The playground! Kids are running in every direction. Does Pete worry? Goodness no! He slides and he swings and he sings his song. I'm playing in my school shoes. I'm playing in my school shoes. I'm playing in my school shoes. All day long, Pete sings his song. I'm singing in my school shoes. I'm painting in my school shoes. I'm adding in my school shoes. I'm riding in my school shoes. When school is done, Pete rides the bus home. Pete's mom asks him, what did you do at school today? And Pete says, I was rocking in my school shoes. I was rocking in my school shoes. I was rocking in my school shoes. And I will do it again tomorrow. Because it's all good. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Pete the Cat, Cave Cat Pete by James Dean. Cave Cat Pete wakes up early. The sun is shining, the birds are singing. Today is going to be a great day, Pete thinks. But then, Pete's bed starts to shake. His friend Vinny the Velociraptor is coming to visit. It's a perfect day for a picnic, says Vinny. What a great idea, says Pete. Who should we invite? Everyone, Vinny yells. Right on, says Pete. He loves picnics. He heads out to invite all his friends. First, Pete finds his good friend Ethel the Apatosaurus. To get her attention, Pete climbs all the way up to the top of the tallest tree. Would you like to come to a picnic? Pete asks. I'd love to, says Ethel. What can I bring? How about a really big salad? Pete suggests. What a great idea, says Ethel. I'm on it. Pete wanders along the river. He sees T-Rex. T-Rex plays guitar. T 
T-Rex is awesome. Hey, T-Rex, Pete yells. Want to come to a picnic? Sweet, says T-Rex. Can I bring my guitar? Definitely, says Pete. We can jam. Count me in, says T-Rex. Okay, if I bring Al the Allosaurus, he's a whiz on the drums. The more the merrier, says Pete. Pete sees his friend Terry the Pterosaur in the sky. Hi, Pete, she calls. Pete invites Terry to the picnic, too. Would you mind giving me a lift, Pete asks. Sure, says Terry. Climb aboard. Pete sees the spiked tail of his main man, Skip, the Stegosaurus. How are you feeling today, Skip? Pete asks. Skip has been sick with the sniffles. Better, says Skip. Thanks for asking. You up for a picnic? I think so, says Skip. I'd hate to miss the fun. It's almost time for the picnic. Cave Cat Pete rushes through the forest. He doesn't want to be late. Whoops! Pete trips over Trini the Triceratops. We're playing hide and seek, she says, before Pete can ask what she was doing. I think I hit a little too well. How long have you been there? asks Pete. Mm, what's today? asks Trini. Well, all the dinosaurs are going to be at the picnic grounds. Want to come? Pete asks. What a great idea! Maybe somebody there will play hide and seek with me. It's time for the picnic. Vinny and Ethel are setting up the picnic tables. T-Rex and Al are warming up to play some tunes. Terry and Trini are playing hide and seek. Even Skip seems to be enjoying himself. It doesn't get any better than this, Pete says. T-Rex comes over then. Hey, Pete, he asks. Is there anything else to eat? I'm a carnivore. I don't eat salad. Trini comes over. Terry is cheating at hide and seek. She's flying all around and peeking. Skip comes over. I don't feel so good, he says, and he sneezes. The dinosaurs all start to argue. The picnic will be ruined if Pete doesn't do something. He leans over to Al and says, Can you give me a beat? Pete takes out his guitar, and he starts to sing. Before long, everyone is having a great time. You know, T-Rex tells Ethel, I've never actually tried salad before. Try it, says Pete. I bet you'll like it. T-Rex tastes the salad. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Yum, says T-Rex. This salad is delicious. Everyone grabs a plate and digs in. Everyone decides to play hide and seek. Pete is happy that everyone is getting along. He feels lucky to have such great friends. This was the best picnic ever. Everyone agrees. It was the best picnic because you guys are the best friends ever. Pete says, and no one can argue with that. Thanks for watching! Click subscribe! Pip and Squeak by Ian Schoner Squeak pinched Pip, and Pip squeaked. We're right, said Squeak. Don't forget the gift for Gus! Snow, said Squeak. Get a sled! Thanks for watching! Click subscribe! Thomas and Friends, Blue Mountain Mystery, the movie, Risky Rails. Illustrated by Tommy Stubbs. Blue Mountain Quarry was a very busy place. Oh, 
quarry moved equipment up and down the steep walls. Rusty shunted trucks of slate. The quarry engines were smaller and lighter than the other engines and ran on special tracks. Paxton, a visiting diesel, was impressed by the hard-working narrow-gauge engines. Suddenly, with a rumble, Blondin Bridge began to collapse. Reneus saw the danger ahead and tried to stop, but his heavy load pushed him across the bridge. Reneus was safe. Everyone was relieved. Then they saw poor Paxton, half buried in stone. He wasn't hurt, but he needed some repairs. Sir Topham Hat asked Thomas to work in Paxton's place. I like working with my narrow gauge friends, he peeped. He turned off to the quarry, where he was met with whistles of welcome. The work at the quarry was hard, but Thomas enjoyed it. Suddenly, a small green engine darted out of a tunnel. Hello, Thomas peeped, but the engine rolled into another tunnel without answering. The next morning, Thomas saw the little green engine again. Who are you? Thomas asked. The little engine puffed off without answering. Thomas tried to follow. Go, Luke! Scarlowy cried as he and the other narrow gauge engines blocked Thomas. Who is Luke? Thomas asked Scarlowy. Why does he run away? He hides because long ago he did something very bad, Scarlowy said. He's afraid that if he's found, he'll be sent away from Sodor forever. Thomas promised to keep Luke's secret. Later, Thomas steamed off alone to think. Don't worry, Luke, he said aloud. I'll find a way to help you. Someone was watching. The next day, Luke emerged from a tunnel and approached Thomas. I'm sorry I hid from you, he said. Will you be my friend? I'd like that, Thomas replied. Thomas and Luke worked together at the boulder drop. Thomas asked Luke why he had to hide. They didn't notice that Paxton, who had returned to the quarry, was listening as Luke told his story. I came to the island of Sodor by boat, Luke began. There was also a little yellow engine who spoke a strange language. While I was being lifted off the boat, I bumped the yellow engine and he went splashing into the sea. Paxton couldn't believe what he had heard. He raced off to tell Diesel. At that moment, an idea flew into Thomas's funnel. I know what I'll do, he said. I'll find out what happened to that little yellow engine. Maybe he's at the Diesel Works. Thomas was shocked to hear Paxton repeating Luke's story to Diesel. We have to tell, said Diesel. Luke will have to leave Sodor forever. Thomas had to find the little yellow engine. He chucked to the steamworks to talk to Victor. That engine was me, Victor said. Victor's story about his journey to Sodor matched Luke's. But there was one big difference. The chains holding my wheels were broken, he said. That's why I slid into the sea when the green engine bumped me. When Cranky fished me out, I was in a terrible state. It was an accident, peeped Thomas, and you were repaired? Yes, said Victor. I chose to be painted red, a new color for my bright new life. I have to tell Luke, Thomas said. Is Luke the little green engine? asked Victor. Yes, said Thomas, and he needs your help. Later, Diesel and Paxton found Luke at the quarry. Luke rolled up the narrow gauge tracks where Thomas and the other engines couldn't follow. You can't hide now, shouted Diesel. Sir Topham Hat is coming to kick you off Sodor. Even Thomas can't save you. Yes, I can, Thomas peeked as he sped into the quarry. Rocky and Owen helped Thomas climb all the way up the quarry's walls. But Thomas's wheels were too big for the narrow gauge tracks at the top. They jumped off the rails and Thomas rolled toward the edge of the cliff. Thomas peeped. Just then, Luke came around the bend. Watch out, Thomas! cried Diesel. He's going to push you off, just like he did that yellow engine. Don't worry, said Luke. I'll pull you back to Owen. And slowly but surely, he pulled Thomas back toward the platform. Luke felt strong. Luke got Thomas safely to Owen's platform. But the two engines weighed too much for Owen. The platform began to drop straight down. Cinders and ashes! peeped Thomas. Gears whined, sparks flew, but Owen brought Thomas and Luke safely down. Just then, Sir Topham Hat arrived with Mr. Percival, the narrow gauge controller. They were confused and angry. Then, Victor steamed into the quarry. Luke, you didn't push me, he said. It was an accident. 
Sir Topham Hatt was upset with Diesel. You didn't find out what really happened, he said, and the real story is what matters. Well done, Thomas, said Sir Topham Hatt. Today is a happy day for Mr. Percival and his engines. Thomas has made it a happy day, sir, Luke said. He's my hero and my friend. Thomas and all his friends, new and old, whistled happily. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Thomas and Friends, The Runaway Kite. Based on the railway series by the Reverend W. Audrey. It was a nice day. The sky was blue. Thomas picked up a box at the docks. The box was for the kite festival. On the way, Thomas saw a kite. Oh no, the kite flew away. Thomas wanted to catch the kite. Edward wanted to help, but Thomas wanted to catch the kite by himself. He went fast. Emily wanted to help, but Thomas wanted to catch the kite by himself. He went faster. Percy wanted to help, but Thomas wanted to catch the kite by himself. He went even faster. Thomas found the kite, but now Thomas was out of steam. He could not catch the kite. He could not deliver the box. Edward had steam. Emily had steam. Percy had steam. The three friends helped Thomas. They caught the kite. The kite flew at the kite festival. Thomas was happy to have good friends. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Sneezy the Snowman by Maureen Wright, illustrated by Stephen Gilpin. Sneezy the Snowman shivered. Urgh, it's cold out here, that's for sure. I need a drink to warm me up. So, he drank cocoa from a cup. He said with a smile, I like this a lot. And then, right there, believe it or not, he melted from drinking something too hot. The children cried out, what should we do? A voice from the puddle said, make me brand new. They rebuilt Sneezy as snowflakes flew. A cold winter wind swirled and blew. The snowman sneezed a gigantic achoo! I'm sneezing and freezing and shivering too! A little girl said, then let's share. I have something you can wear. Here's my hat to put on your head. You look awesome, the children said. The snowman blinked his coal black eyes. The stocking cap was a nice surprise. But Sneezy the snowman shivered. Brr, it's cold out here, that's for sure. I am freezing every minute. I'll find a hot tub and sit right in it. He found one and smiled. I like this a lot. And then, right there, believe it or not, he melted from sitting in water too hot. The children cried out, what should we do? A voice from the hot tub said, make me brand new. They rebuilt Sneezy as snowflakes flew. A cold winter wind swirled and blew. The snowman sneezed a gigantic achoo! I'm sneezing and freezing and shivering too! A little boy said, then let's share. I have something you can wear. Here's my scarf that's red and blue. I think it would look great on you. The snowman blinked his coal black eyes. The colorful scarf was a nice surprise. It went very well with the long pink hat. The children all said, how about that? But Sneezy the snowman shivered. Brr, it's cold out here, that's for sure. I need to feel some warmth on me. There's a campfire by that tree. He said with a smile, I like this a lot. And then, right there, believe it or not, he melted from standing beside something hot. The children cried out, what should we do? A voice from the puddle said, Make me brand new. They rebuilt Sneezy as snowflakes flew. A cold winter wind swirled and blew. The snowman sneezed a gigantic achoo! I'm sneezing and freezing and shivering too. A little girl said, then let's share. I have something you can wear. Here's my coat, the perfect fit. I know that you'll look good in it. 
The snowman blinked his coal black eyes. The bright orange coat was a nice surprise. It went very well with the scarf and hat. The children all said, how about that? But Sneezy said, ooh, I'm way too hot. I'll take off all the new clothes I've got. The children yelled, no, that's not the way. Listen to what we have to say. Buy something cold at the ice cream store. Have two scoops or three or four. Sneezy ate ice cream seven scoops high. This is great, the snowman cried. I'm not too cold and I'm not too hot. And I'm wearing clothes I like a lot. Then after eating every bite, he said, at last I feel just right. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Thomas and Friends, Tale of the Brave. Illustrated by Tommy Stubbs. Created by Britt Alcroft. It was a busy and bustling day at the clay pits on the island of Sodor. Thomas was there helping out while a bridge on his branch line was being repaired. He liked working at the pits, but those troublesome engines, Bill and Ben, kept playing tricks on him. There was no time for tricks that day, though. A friendly engine named Timothy warned everybody that rain might be coming. And if it starts to rain, these clay walls will get really unstable. We'd best be careful today. That afternoon, dark clouds filled the sky and cold rain started to fall. As Thomas cautiously rolled down some slippery tracks, the clay wall next to him began to drip and ooze. To his surprise, he saw strange marks under the sliding mud. They looked like giant footprints. But what kind of animal has feet that big? Thomas wondered. Watch out! Ben and Bill shouted. Before Thomas could get a good look at the footprints, the troublesome engines pushed him safely out of the way of a giant, gooey landslide. The next morning, Sir Topham Hatt addressed the engines at the shunting yards. Bill and Ben are best known for playing tricks on other engines, but by rescuing Thomas from yesterday's landslide, they have proven that they are really useful engines. All the engines peeped happily, then rolled off to work. But Thomas couldn't stop thinking about the footprints. Thomas returned to the clay pits, but he couldn't see the footprints. The tracks were closed and covered with mud. Later, at Brendam Docks, Thomas told Percy about the footprints. I don't know what could have made them. They were bigger than any animal on Sodor. Do you mean they are from a monster? Percy wished. Don't be silly, Percy. There's no such thing as monsters. For the rest of the day, Percy couldn't stop thinking about monsters. He didn't want to see anything scary. But later, as he came to the top of a hill, he did see a strange shape in the distance. What's that? Percy puffed. I hope it's not a monster. Percy reversed and raced backward all the way to the docks. It's the monster from the clay pits. Percy whistled as he barreled into the docks. Everyone watched as something rumbled down the rails. That be no monster, Salty puffed. That be an engine. I don't usually get mistaken for a monster, the big engine tooted. Mind you, they do call me Gator. It seems they think my long water tanks make me look like an alligator. Percy felt very silly for thinking the new engine was a monster. Everywhere Percy went that night, he thought he saw strange creatures. Old trees and haystacks became monsters with clutching claws. Fluttering laundry on a clothesline looked like ghosts. Percy was so scared, he didn't even deliver the mail. He asked Thomas to pull the mail trucks. Thomas agreed to do it for one night. The next morning, Thomas heard that the bridge on his branch line was open again. He was happy to go back to his usual work. But James was unhappy. Sir Topham Hatt had asked him to pick up a load of scrap metal. It's not fair, James puffed. Thomas gets to pull coaches, and a fine engine like myself is sent to haul junk. As James rolled off in a grumpy mood, he saw Percy. Hello, scaredy engine, he puffed. See any monsters lately? You can tease me if you want, Percy peeped. 
But Thomas saw giant footprints at the pits. There might be monsters on Sodor. Puff and nonsense, James remarked as he rolled to the scrapyard. James was busy thinking about monsters when he turned the corner into the scrapyard and came face to face with jagged teeth and crooked claws. No! James peeped. Help! Hello, mate. Ridge, the scrap crane, puffed. Looks like that scrap gave you a fright. James realized it was only a pile of old gears and broken metal in front of him. I'm not afraid of some broken old machines, he puffed. Down at the docks, Percy was pleasantly surprised to find Gator waiting in a siding. What are you doing here? Percy asked. I'm heading to a new job, Gator puffed. Unfortunately, my ship has been delayed. I have to wait until a new one can be found. At least you don't have to worry about sea monsters, Percy peeped. For all I know, sea monsters would be worried about me, Gator puffed with a laugh. Wow, Percy peeped. I wish I were as brave as you. Being brave is not the same as not feeling scared, Percy. Being brave is what you do even when you feel scared. You might be braver than you think. Inspired by Gator's words, Percy decided to be brave and pull the mail trucks all by himself that night. His boiler bubbled boldly as he chugged across the countryside. Nothing scared him. Not the fluttering laundry, not the old gnarled trees. Gator is right, he tooted. I can be brave. Grumpy James was not nearly as happy. He needed to haul the flying kipper, which was full of fresh fish. As he rounded a bend in the woods, he saw a large, shadowy shape. He didn't realize it was only Gator. His whistle screaming, James raced away. He was so frightened that he missed a red signal and jumped off the rails into a pond. James was very embarrassed that Rocky had to hoist him out of the pond. When the other engines saw him at Knapford Junction, they had a good laugh. You were meant to deliver the fish, Henry puffed, not throw them back in the water. James didn't like these jokes one bit. He'd show everyone that Percy was the real scaredy engine, not him. That night, as Percy was delivering the mail, he saw something unusual on the tracks. Something big. This definitely wasn't a haystack or a funny-looking engine. It groaned and flashed its big teeth in the moonlight. Percy didn't want to be brave anymore. He dropped his mail trucks and raced back to the sheds as fast as his little wheels would carry him. The monster! Percy whistled as he rolled to the sheds. I really saw it! None of the other engines believed him. You probably saw another haystack, James mocked. Percy looked desperately to Thomas. Tell him! There really are monsters on Sodor! Tell him about the footprints you saw! I don't know what I saw, Thomas peeped, but I don't think it was a monster. There's no such thing as monsters, steamed Henry. Never was and never will be. Admit it, Percy. You're just a scaredy engine, James peeped. But James, you got a fright when you saw Gator, Percy puffed. No, I didn't, James steamed. I just missed a signal in the dark. He looked at the other engines. I wasn't scared. Like Percy. Early the next morning, Percy steamed away from the sheds to find his mail trucks. On the way, he saw Gator and asked him to come along. You'll know what to do if we see any monsters. Monsters? Gator puffed with a laugh. You are a funny little engine. Well, it's good to have a new friend on the island, Percy peeped. I'm glad you're not going away. But I am. My ship is here. I leave tonight. Percy couldn't believe it. Later that morning, Thomas saw James with a truck full of scraps. It was at the turn where Percy had seen the monster. James, Thomas tooted. You made a monster out of scrap metal to give Percy a fright? It was only a little joke, James replied. Not to Percy. You need to find him and tell him what you did and apologize. The two engines split up to find Percy. Thomas found Percy at Knapford Station. He tried to tell him about James's prank, but Percy wouldn't listen. I thought you were my friend, Percy peeped. When you told me about the footprints, I believed you. And when I told you about the monster, you should have believed me. Maybe I should go far away like Gator. Percy puffed off in a huff. 
Lucy raced down to the docks and told Cranky to hoist him onto Gator's ship. Are you sure Sir Topham Hatch wants you on this ship? The big crane asked. Yes, Percy peeped. I'm going to work far away like Gator. Percy was loaded onto the deck of the ship. It wasn't long before Gator was lowered next to him. I'm going to work in a faraway land, Percy puffed. I'll show everyone how brave I can be. Gator thought for a moment. But running away from your problems is not very brave, Percy. Thomas chugged across Sodor, looking for Percy. But when he heard a distant ship blow its horn, a terrible thought flew into his funnel. Oh no, Thomas peeped. I know where Percy is going. Gator's ship was just leaving when Thomas reached the docks. Cranky, he whistled. You have to stop that ship. It's an emergency. Cranky swung his hook and caught the ship's rail. His heavy chain rattled and strained as the great boat tried to pull away. The force was too great for Cranky. He started to tip over. Creak! Workmen on the ship tried to knock the hook loose with sledgehammers. Luckily, the captain was able to stop the ship before Cranky was pulled off the docks. Percy! Come down! Thomas whistled. You can't leave! I'm sorry I didn't believe you! Gator peered over the railing of the ship. Percy's not here. Percy! Cranky groaned. I unloaded him half an hour ago. Thomas could think of only one other place where Percy might go. Night was falling as Percy quietly rolled through the clay pits. He stopped when he reached the warning signs. If I can find the footprints, it will prove the monster is real, he thought. Then everyone will know how brave I am. At that moment, James rolled up. He started to apologize, but Percy interrupted him. I'm braver than you'll ever be, Percy puffed. James didn't like Percy's attitude. If you're so brave, why have you stopped at the danger signs? Being brave doesn't mean not being careful, Percy peeped. That's just what I thought a scaredy engine would say, puffed James, as he pushed past Percy and the signs. He rolled into the narrow gorge. The cliff walls were still drippy and loose from the landslide. Oh, monster, James called. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Suddenly, James saw something in the moonlight. It had claws and teeth. The monster, leashed James. He tried to back up, but the walls began to rumble and tumble. It's another landslide, Percy peeped. You have to go forward, James. The little green engine raced ahead to push James out of the way. Rocks hit Percy and mud slid into his cab. And the big monster landed right in front of him. That was when Percy made a discovery. It wasn't a monster. It was some sort of rock. The next day, Percy went to the steamworks for a good cleaning. He had lots of mud in his funnel and gears. While he was there, James and Thomas visited and apologized. I hope we're still friends, Thomas peeped. Of course we are, Percy replied. We all are. All three engines reached and whistled with joy. That afternoon, Thomas carried a group of scientists to the clay pits. They were amazed by what Percy had found in the mud. It's a dinosaur fossil, one scientist explained to Thomas. Fossils are what we call bones that have been in the ground for millions of years. So the monster was really a dinosaur from a long, long time ago, Thomas peeped in amazement. He couldn't wait to tell Percy. Soon, the fossils were put on display in the Knapford Town Square. Excited families and curious engines came from all over the island of Sodor to see them. A perfect specimen of a megalosaurus, the Earl of Sodor exclaimed. How marvelous! Sir Topham Hat addressed the crowd. Today was made possible by a very special engine. Percy is not only a really useful fossil hunter, but also one of the bravest engines on Sodor. The people clapped and cheered, and the engines blew their whistles. But Percy was nowhere to be seen. Percy was at Brendam Docks saying goodbye to Gator. Gator's ship was ready to depart again. As it steamed into the distance, Thomas and James pulled up alongside Percy. I guess you have to be brave to say goodbye to someone too, 
Percy peeped. Did Gator say that? Thomas asked. No, but he did say something else wise, Percy puffed, and his two friends rolled in closer to hear. He said not to let James near any ponds or fish again. Even James thought that was a funny joke. The three friends giggled and whistled with joy. In the early 1940s, a loving father crafted a small blue wooden engine for his son, Christopher. The stories that this father, the Reverend W. Audrey, made up to company the wonderful toy were first published in 1945. Reverend Audrey continued to create new adventures and characters until 1972, when he retired from writing. Tommy Stubbs has been an illustrator for several decades. Lately, he has been illustrating the newest tales of Thomas and his engine friends, including Hero of the Rails, Misty Island Rescue, Day of the Diesels, and King of the Railway. Thanks for watching! Click subscribe so you don't miss Thomas and Friends' next adventure! The Biggest Best Snowman by Marjorie Kyler Illustrated by Will Hillenbrand Little Nell lived with Big Mama, Big Sarah, and Big Lizzie in a big house in a big snowy woods. Big Mama, Big Sarah, and Big Lizzie had big blustery voices. They had big talky friends. They had big, loud parties. When Little Nell asked, Can I help? Big Mama, Big Sarah, and Big Lizzie shook their heads. No, you can't, they said. You're too small. Yes, I can, said Little Nell. And no, I'm not. No, you can't, they said. And yes, you are. So Little Nell would go into the big snowy woods. She would sit and watch the snow fall from the sky. She would walk under the bare branched trees. She would play with her friends. Reindeer, Hare, and Bear Cub. One day, Bear Cub said to Little Nell, Can you show us how to make a snowman? No, I can't, said Little Nell. I'm too small. Yes, you can, said the animals. And no, you are not. But I'm so small, said Little Nell. My family won't let me do anything. I could never make a snowman. How do you know unless you try, asked Bear Cub. We'll help you. Little Nell sighed. Maybe, she said. Little Nell got down on her knees. She carefully patted and matted and batted the snow into a tiny ball. She rolled it and rolled it and rolled it to reindeer. Reindeer nudged it and nudged it and nudged it to hare. Hare kicked it and kicked it and kicked it to bear cub. Bear cub rolled it and rolled it and rolled it until it stopped. Thud by the edge of a big icy pond. Now what? asked Reindeer. The snowman needs a middle, said Little Nell. How do we do that? asked Hare. Little Nell bit her lip. She got down on her knees. She carefully patted and matted and batted another tiny snowball. She rolled it and rolled it to Reindeer. Reindeer nudged it and nudged it to Hare. Hare kicked it and kicked it to Bear Cub. Bear Cub rolled it and rolled it until... Thud! It came to a stop. He pushed it on top of the other snowball. Now what? he asked. Needs a head, cried little Nell. She patted and matted and batted another tiny snowball. Then she rolled it to reindeer. Reindeer nudged it to hare. Hare kicked it to bear cub. Bear cub stuck it on top of the other two snowballs. Little Nell and the animals stood back and looked at their snowman. Something's missing, said hare. The face, said little Nell. How do we do that? asked the animals. I think we'll need help, said little Nell. She whistled for the birds to come. Crow, Cardinal, and Sparrow flew down from the trees. Could you make a face for our snowman? She asked. Crow fetched two pieces of bark for the eyes. Cardinal found an old pink sock for the nose. Sparrow brought raisins for the mouth. Little Nell handed her green scarf to the birds. They wound it and wound it and wound it around the snowman's neck. Then they added two sticks for arms. The snowman was finally finished. Little Nell and the animals gazed up at their creation. Wow, said the animals. Wow, said Little Nell. It was almost lunchtime. Little Nell said goodbye to her friends. She walked home through the big snowy woods. Big Mama, Big Sarah, and Big Lizzie were waiting for her. Where have you been? They asked in their big blustery voices. I was building a great big snowman, answered Little Nell. How could someone as little as you build a great big snowman? Asked Big Lizzie. Come and see.
said Little Nell. So, Big Mama, Big Sarah, and Big Lizzie followed Little Nell through the big snowy woods to the snowman. As they looked up, their mouths dropped open and their arms dropped to their sides. Wow, they said. You built that? Yes, I did, said Little Nell, with the help of my friends. That is the biggest, best snowman that ever was, said Big Mama. Yes, it is, said Little Nell, a huge smile on her face. Will you come and help us to make a big yummy lunch? asked Big Sarah. No, she can't, said Big Lizzie. She's still too small. Yes, I can, said Little Nell, and no, I'm not. Yes, you can, said Big Mama, and yes, you will. Big Mama gave Little Nell a big sloppy kiss. Smooch! Big Sarah gave Little Nell a big squeezy hug. Ooch! Big Lizzie stuck her big nose in the air. <laughs> Little Nell's friends lifted her to the top of the snowman. Hooray! Thanks for watching! Click subscribe! Diary of a Spider Written by Doreen Cronin Pictures by Harry Bliss March 1st Today was Grandparents' Day at school, so I brought Grandpa with me. He taught us three things. 1. Spiders are not insects. Insects have six legs. 2. Without spiders, insects could take over the world. 3. Butterflies taste better with a little barbecue sauce. March 16th. Grandpa says that in his day, flies and spiders did not get along. Spiders and flies rumble in the city. Things are different now. This is awesome! March 29th. Today in gym class, we learned how to catch the wind so we could travel to faraway places. Next! When I got home, I made up flashcards so I could practice. 1. Climb high. 2. Release silk. 3. Catch wind. Fly made up her own flashcard. 1. Fly. I'm starting to see why Grandpa doesn't like her. April 1st. Went to the park with my sister today. We tried the seesaw. It didn't work. We tried the tire swing. It didn't work. We spun a huge sticky web on the water fountain. That worked! Eek! April 12th. Today was safety day at school. We learned that vacuums eat spider webs and are very, very dangerous. If we hear a vacuum, we should stop, drop, and run. Stop what we're doing, drop from the web, run like crazy. April 13th. We had a vacuum drill today. I stopped what I was doing, forgot where I was going, and ran screaming from the room. Help! We're having another drill tomorrow. April 17th. I'm sleeping over at Worm's house tonight. I hope they don't have leaves and rotten tomatoes for dinner again. More leaves, spider? May 7th. Mom said I was getting too big for my own skin, so I molted. That is so gross. May 8th. Today was show and tell, so I brought in my old skin. My teacher called on it to lead the Pledge of Allegiance. You there, why don't you get us started? June 5th. Daddy Longlegs made fun of Fly because she eats with her feet. Now she won't come out of her treehouse. I'm going to find him and give him a piece of my mind. June 6th. I found Daddy Longlegs. He's a lot bigger than I thought he was. I gave him a piece of my lunch instead. June 7th. Fly's treehouse blew away in the wind today. So did Grandpa. June 18th. I got a postcard from Grandpa today. Dear Spider, ooh la la, I landed in Paris. French bugs are delicious. Au revoir, Grandpa. Leg of French gnat. Give it a try. June 30th. Grandpa came home today. I couldn't wait to hear about how he rode the winds all the way over the ocean. Turns out he caught a breeze to the airport and napped in first class. July 2nd. Fly came over to play today. She got stuck in our web, and her mom had to come get her. Grandpa laughed a little too hard. From now on, we have to play at Fly's house. July 9th. Today was my birthday. Grandpa decided I was old enough to know the secret to a long, happy life. Never fall asleep in a shoe. July 16th. 
things I scare. One, Fly's mom. It wasn't his fault, mom. Two, tiny bugs. Three, people using water fountains at the park. July 17th, things that scare me. One, daddy long legs. Two, vacuums. Three, people with big feet. August 1st, I wish that people wouldn't judge all the spiders based on the few spiders that bite. I know if we took the time to get to know each other, we would get along just fine, just like me and Fly. Dad made me this. Worm found this. My best friends. My first molted skin. Extended family reunion. I made this slingshot. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. King of the Railway, the Lost Crown of Sodor. It was a busy day at Brendan Docks. Thomas and Percy were shunting trucks. One of the trucks bashed into Percy's buffer and tipped over. A crate fell out and split open. Look, peeped Percy. It's a metal man, a robot. Silly, Cranky grumbled. It's a suit of armor, like a knight used to wear. Cranky's right, said Sir Topham Hat. In the old days, the island of Sodor was ruled by kings. The most beloved was King Godred. He lived in Ulfstead Castle and wore a golden crown. The crown disappeared long ago. Sir Topham Hatt said that the ruins of Ulfstead Castle could be seen on the Earl of Sodor's estate. The next morning, Thomas delivered a crate to the Earl's estate. There he met Millie, the Earl's narrow-gauge engine. If only I had King Godred's golden crown, the Earl said sadly. Over the next few days, Thomas, James, and Percy made many deliveries to the Earl's estate. Thomas saw his friend, Jack the Digger, there. I'm helping the Earl restore Ulfstead Castle, Jack puffed. So that's his plan, whistled Thomas. When Thomas, Percy, and James were shunting containers, Thomas saw a flatbed holding a very large crate. The Earl said it was a special delivery for the steamworks. He climbed into Thomas's cab, and the three friends pulled the crate to the steamworks. When they got there, a gantry crane lifted the crate to reveal an old engine named Stephen. His wood was worn, and he had rust holes in his boiler. He hadn't run in years. Surprise! The old engine peeped. Victor said that he'd have Stephen fixed up in no time. The Earl told Thomas he had a special job for Stephen, but it's best not to say anything. I won't say a word, said Thomas. I promise. Victor worked quickly. Soon Stephen was good as new. You look really useful again, Thomas peeped. Stephen had told the engines about his early days. I worked so fast, they called me the rocket, he said. But what job would he do now? As the others rolled away to work, Thomas saw that Stephen looked sad. So Thomas broke his promise and told Stephen that the Earl had a special job for him. Stephen was very excited. Thomas, James, and Percy steamed to the Earl's estate. Inside the castle walls, they were amazed to see a giant platform on rails. The Earl called it the Traveler. You three will move the Traveler into place for the men. You must be careful to keep the platform stable. Meanwhile, Stephen wanted to know about his special job. So he rolled off to Brendam Docks. There's no work here for an old engine like you, Cranky said. Next, Stephen went to Blue Mountain Quarry. We can always use help, Luke peeped. But the trucks Stephen tried to pull were too heavy. He steamed and strained, but they wouldn't move. When I worked in a mine, the trucks weren't this heavy, said Stephen. Are there any mines around here? Scarlobi told him there was an old mine near the castle ruins. I don't think anyone works there now, he said. Stephen found the entrance to the abandoned mine. He sighed. There's no job on this island for me. Nearby, Thomas was working with the troublesome trucks. Suddenly, the truck slipped loose and roared down the hill, right towards Stephen. Stephen had no choice but to push into the mine. His funnel hit the roof and fell off. Rocks crashed down behind him, sealing up the entrance. Stephen searched for a way out. He crept around dark bends and through empty tunnels, but the tracks just went in circles. The only thing he found was an old wooden crate. Thomas and Percy searched for Stephen at the entrance to the old mine. Thomas saw something familiar lying on the ground. It was Stephen's funnel. Thomas chuffed away to get Jack the Digger. 
Jack cleared the mine entrance and Thomas raced in. Stephen! Stephen! He peeped. Stephen heard Thomas, but he was too weak to move or even whistle. Finally, Thomas turned a corner and saw a welcome sight. Thomas pushed Stephen out of the mine. The Earl was there to greet them. I found a big wooden chest in the mine, Stephen said. Wonderful, the Earl exclaimed. But first, we must get you ready for tomorrow. You are an engine with a special job to do. The next day, an excited crowd gathered around Ulfstead Castle. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, engines and coaches, said the Earl. Let me introduce my special steam engine, Stephen. He and Millie will be happy to show you the grounds. Stephen's new funnel glittered like gold. It reminded Thomas of something. Stephen found something I thought was lost forever, the Earl said. King Godred's long-lost crown. Thomas realized what Stephen's funnel looked like. A crown! The engines cheered for Stephen. He wasn't the fastest or the strongest, but he was really useful. And today, he was a king. Thanks for watching! Click subscribe! Thomas and Friends, The Lost Ship Based on the Railway Series by the Reverend W. Audrey Illustrated by Richard Courtney The sun comes up! Time for work! But Thomas does not want to work! He wants to race! Look out, Thomas! Crash! Down, down, down he falls. Thomas lands next to a lost pirate ship. Thomas meets Sailor John and his boat, Skiff. They are looking for treasure. The sailor has a map. X marks the spot. They look and look. They do not find it. Marion finds the treasure. It will go in a museum. The sailor is angry. He steals the chest that night. Skip and Thomas try to stop him. The chest is heavy. Skip starts to sink. The sailor has to let the treasure go. Splash! Down, down, down it falls. The police take Sailor John away. The treasure is lost, but not for long. Divers haul it up from the deep. The treasure finds a new home. Skiff finds a new job. Skiff's railboat harbor tours. Thomas is as happy as can be. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. The Very Hungry Caterpillars First Winter. There are so many ways to spend a chilly snow day. Indoors where it's cozy, or outside for some play. Watch icicles form and snowflakes flurry. There's fun to be had outside if you hurry. Bundle up with a coat and a hat to stay warm when the cold wind blows in a frosty snowstorm. Slip and slide across ice that's smooth to the touch. Jump around and splash in a pile of snow slush. Footsteps go crunch and red cardinals sing. Can you guess what's baking when the oven goes ding? The smell of cinnamon swirls through the air. These treats were baked with love and care. There are warm sugar cookies with sprinkles for munching and sweet hot chocolate for when they need dunking. That snack was tasty, but it's time to go. Back outside to play in the snow. Snowballs fly and snowmen stand tall. Winter is a season that's so fun for all. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Thomas and the Dinosaur. Illustrated by Tom Lapadula. Created by Britt Allcroft. One day, Percy rushed into the shed. I saw a monster in the forest, he said. What's a monster? Thomas asked. Monsters are very big animals with very big teeth, Percy answered. And they eat engines. Thomas was a little bit scared to go near the forest, but he had work to do. Suddenly, 
he saw a very big animal with very big teeth. Thomas shouted as he raced back to tell Percy. I saw it, Thomas said with a shudder. The monster? Percy asked. Yes, Thomas replied, but I got away. Just then, Sir Topham Hat came into the shed. Thomas, he said, I need you to bring a special load from the forest. Now Thomas was really worried. What if he met up with the monster again? Slowly, slowly, Thomas puffed back to the forest with his driver. Through the trees, Thomas again saw that very big animal with the very big teeth. Monster! He shouted to his driver. That's not a monster, the driver said. That's just a model of a dinosaur. What's a dinosaur? Thomas asked him. Dinosaurs were animals that lived a long, long time ago, the driver explained. This is a model for Sodor's new dinosaur park. Thomas chugged a little closer and saw that his driver was right. Soon, Harold the helicopter arrived to lift the dinosaur. Then, some workers guided Harold as he carefully lowered the model onto Thomas's flatbed. Percy was puffing along the line when Thomas passed by. Monster! Percy shouted when he saw the dinosaur. Don't worry, Percy, Thomas said to his friend. This is not a monster at all. This is a dinosaur model for the new dinosaur park. Thomas was very proud to be carrying the dinosaur model. He rolled past the schoolyard with the dinosaur, and the children waved with excitement. Beep, beep, Thomas called. Finally, Thomas reached the dinosaur park. Sir Topham Hat met him there. Good work, Thomas, Sir Hat said. You've been very useful today. The dinosaur was placed in a spot where everyone could see it, from inside the park and out. And every time he passed by, Thomas smiled and gave a special... Thanks for watching! Click subscribe! Thomas and the Great Discovery Illustrated by Tommy Stubbs Created by Britt Alcroft It was a beautiful day on the island of Sodor. Thomas was high in the hills, bringing some freight cars to the wharf. At an unfamiliar junction, he saw an old overgrown track that looked like a shortcut. Soon he was rattling down the steep track. No one has been down here for a very long time, he huffed. Then Thomas gasped. <gasps> Fizzling fireboxes! He had arrived at a station. It too was overgrown, rusty, and very old. There were crumbling platforms, and the station building was covered in ivy. Thomas had never seen such an amazing sight. What a funny place to have a station, he peeped and looked around some more. There are so many buildings. It looks like an old town, he cried. I cannot wait to tell everyone about this. So Thomas bumped and bashed along the old track and finally made his way down to the wharf. The next day, the news of Thomas's discovery was all over Sodor. Sir Topham Hatt wanted to visit the hidden town at once. Thomas, you have made a wonderful discovery. This was the town of Great Waterton. When steam engines first came to Sodor, Sir Topham Hatt said, this was an important town. It was called Great Waterton because the springs here provided water for everyone on the island. Why does no one live here now? puffed Thomas. The springs ran dry and the people left to live in new towns. The maps were lost. Everyone thought the town of Great Waterton was lost forever too. But now it is found, cheered Thomas. And if we work hard, added Sir Topham Hatt, we can have the rededication of the town on Sodor Day. In no time, all of Sodor was working hard to fix up Great Waterton. Because Thomas had rediscovered the town, Sir Topham Hatt put him in charge of all the repair work. It was also Thomas's responsibility to explore all the old tracks around Great Waterton. Thomas liked checking old lines, and he liked being in charge. He wanted to show everyone he could do everything. But one day... There was trouble. Thomas was puffing too fast, and the track was too old. He toppled off the track. Harvey came to lift him back on, but Thomas was bumped and bruised and had to go to the works. While Thomas was at the works, a friendly new engine named Stanley was put in charge of the work at Great Waterton. When Thomas was as good as new, he hurried back to Great Waterton. A lot had changed. 
Sir Topham Hat met Thomas. Stanley has done a good job, so I have decided that Stanley will stay in charge, and you will help him. Thomas's funnel flattened. He had lost the most important job of all. The next day, Stanley asked Thomas to shunt some freight cars. Thomas was very good at shunting freight cars, and he really liked doing it. But he didn't like Stanley telling him what to do. Still, he wanted to show how really useful he was, so he shunted freight cars all over Great Waterton. Then he remembered seeing an old freight car stuck in front of the abandoned Morgan's Mine. I'll bring that last one in, and Sir Topham Hat will give me my old job back. Thomas smiled. At last, Thomas found the old freight car, and he buffered up. But he biffed the car too hard. It rolled forward and disappeared into the mine. Cinders and ashes! exclaimed Thomas. Where did it go? He moved ahead and peered inside. I must finish the job, he huffed. I'll soon find that freight car. And Thomas puffed into the mine. It was very dark. Thomas was happy he had a bright lamp. He looked ahead and saw the freight car rolling away down a slope. Then it disappeared around a bend. Bust my buffers, puffed Thomas. I'd better go after it. Thomas whizzed down the steep slope. Whee! He whistled and whoa, he cried. It was scary, but it was also very exciting. Thomas had almost caught up to the freight car. You won't get away from me, he whistled happily. But Thomas didn't notice the junction ahead. The freight car whizzed to the right, but Thomas sped to the left and saw that the tunnel ahead was blocked. Oh no, cried Thomas, and he crashed straight through the blocked tunnel and jumped the track. Now Thomas was deep in the mine in a dark tunnel. To top it all off, his fire had gone out. His boiler would soon grow cold, and there was no one around to hear his whistle. The next morning, Stanley and the other engines arrived for work. Where's Thomas? Stanley asked. The engines looked around. Thomas wasn't there. Thomas was missing. It was the biggest calamity Sodor had ever known. Everyone looked for Thomas. They checked the quarries. They searched the docks. They toured every town. They scoured every hill and hunted in every valley. But Thomas was nowhere to be found. And then Stanley had a thought. Maybe Thomas is up on the forgotten tracks around Great Waterton. I'll look for him there. When Stanley was high up in the hills, he whistled and whistled. Where are you, Thomas? But only his echo came back. Stanley looked everywhere. Then he spotted Morgan's mine. Could Thomas have gone into the mine? Stanley wondered. He whistled one last time. And this time, Thomas heard him. It's Stanley, he gasped. With his very last puff, and his very last huff, Thomas blew his whistle as loudly as he could. And Stanley heard him. He slowly entered the dark mine. Thomas, he whistled happily. Is that you? Thomas had run out of puff. He couldn't whistle again. He could only wait and hope that Stanley would find him. It wasn't long before Thomas heard Stanley chuffing up behind him. Stanley, he peeped. I'm very happy that you are here. Thomas, whistled Stanley. I'm very happy to find you. Where have you been? I was trying to be a really useful engine, tooted Thomas. Don't worry, Thomas, Stanley chuffed. I'll have you back on the track in no time. Soon, Stanley was coupled up to Thomas. He pulled and tugged. Thomas was heavy, but Stanley didn't give up. I can do it, Stanley reached. And with a mighty heave, he pulled his friend back onto the track. Hooray, tooted Thomas. Then there was a very loud crack. The valve in Stanley's boiler had burst. Stanley was a strong engine, but pulling Thomas had been too much. Now Stanley couldn't move. Don't worry, whistled Thomas. It's my turn to help you. With your pull, I can push you home. Stanley smiled. In no time at all, Thomas's boiler was bubbling and his steam was wishing. Thomas found an open siding, got behind Stanley, and started to push. Here we go, Stanley, Thomas huffed happily. Stanley smiled back, and puff by puff, Thomas pushed Stanley up and out of the mine. The old tracks rattled and creaked, but Thomas didn't mind. He was happy and proud to push his new friend Stanley home. At last, Thomas and Stanley pulled into Great Waterton Junction. Thomas was tired, but he had never felt happier. When the other engines saw Thomas and Stanley, they tooted and whistled, 
and soon the sound of engine whistles echoed all around Great Waterton. The news quickly spread throughout Sodor. Thomas has been found, the engines whistled. Sir Topham Hat grandly proclaimed, Stanley saved Thomas, and Thomas saved Stanley. For the next couple of days, everyone worked hard to get Great Waterton ready for Sodor Day. Now, Thomas was happy that Stanley had come to Sodor. Thomas had a wonderful new friend, and just in time, everything was done. The weather for Sodor Day was perfect. Sir Topham Hat arrived and beamed. Well done to you all. This is the grandest Sodor Day ever. He and Lady Hat stood beside the red ribbon with a great big pair of scissors. Thanks to Thomas, Great Waterton is no longer lost. And thanks to Stanley, the work was finished right on time. Welcome to the town of Great Waterton, boomed Sir Topham Hat. Lady Hat snipped the ribbon. We're all really useful engines, puffed Thomas happily. He couldn't have been prouder. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe. Thomas and Friends. Big World. Big Adventures. The Movie. Thomas in Africa. Based on the original script by Andrew Brenner. Adapted by Jeff Smith. Illustrated by Tommy Stubbs. One sunny day, on the island of Sodor, Thomas the Tank Engine met a race car named Ace. He was in a round-the-world rally, speeding through five continents. That's so exciting, Thomas peeped. I've always wanted to see the world. You should do it, replied Ace. You could be the first railway engine to go all the way around the world. The next day, Thomas and Ace set sail for the first continent, Africa. After that, they would go on to South America, North America, Asia, and finally back to Sodor through Europe. When they arrived in Africa, Ace sped off without Thomas. He was headed to a distant city called Dar es Salaam in Tanzania. Ace could go wherever he wanted to, but Thomas had to stick to the rails. A yard manager gave Thomas lots of trucks to be delivered to the faraway city. The little engine set off all by himself. As Thomas passed through the stations, he was given more cars to pull. It was hard work. The hills were big. Luckily, Thomas met an engine named Mia, who offered to help. Two engines are much better than one, she peeped. Thomas replied that he didn't need help. But Thomas did need help. The cars were too heavy for him to pull alone. Mia didn't go away. She stayed with Thomas and helped him with his heavy cars. And when a giant elephant blocked the tracks, she and the trucks sang a lullaby. The elephant wandered off to nap beneath a tree. Mia stayed with Thomas all the way to Dar es Salaam. Okay, everybody, Thomas peeped. Please keep your eyes open for my friend Ace. Kwaku, a giant engine friend of Mia's, said he'd seen a group of race cars. But they're all gone now. Ace must have left without me again, said Thomas. Hmm, Mia said. He doesn't sound like a very good friend. Thomas knew the next stop in Ace's race was Rio de Janeiro in South America. I'll just find a ship and go there by myself, wherever that is. Mia asked if she could help Thomas, but he told her to go home. Then he steamed to the docks and was loaded onto a ship. He continued on his big adventure all alone. When the ship was at sea, Thomas made two discoveries. The first was that Mia was on the ship. She wanted to travel with him and be the second engine to go around the world. The other surprise was... Ace was on board! Why didn't you wait for me? Thomas asked the yellow race car. You want to be a free spirit, don't you? Ace replied. You don't want someone else telling you what to do. You want to have fun! When they reached South America, Ace fueled up and left Thomas alone yet again. What will happen to Thomas now? Turn the book over to read the rest of this exciting story. Thomas and Friends. Big World, Big Adventures. The Movie. Friends Around the World. Based on the original script by Andrew Brenner. Adapted by Jeff Smith. Illustrated by Tommy Stubbs. Thomas had to find a way to follow Ace across South America to the next rally in North America. Luckily, a railway worker needed Thomas to carry coffee all the way to San Francisco in the United States. 
We can take this coffee together, Mia said. The engine steamed through the rainforest, pulling the heavy load. On the way, they found Ace. He had had an accident, so they loaded him up and gave him a ride. They continued on their journey. Then, there was trouble. Thomas ran out of water. But clever Mia thought to use the forest's giant leaves to collect rainwater for his tank. Mia had saved the day. When they reached North America, Ace didn't want to go to San Francisco. He wanted Thomas to take him to the salt flats in Utah so he could get repaired and meet the other racers. Ace convinced Thomas to play a trick on Mia and they sped off without her. Ace told Thomas to go faster and faster as they raced across the western lands. Don't slow down, mate! Let yourself go! Thomas went so fast, he came off the track! Luckily, an old mining engine called Bo, a cowgirl, and some cowboys got him back on the rails. As everyone worked together to help, Thomas realized he'd done a terrible thing to Mia. We should have stayed with her, he peeped. It wasn't nice to play a trick on her. At the salt flats, Ace met up with the other racers. But Thomas didn't continue the race. He wanted to deliver his coffee and find Mia to apologize. He steamed on to San Francisco with his load. Unfortunately, Mia was nowhere to be found. Thomas hoped he could find her at the next stop across the Pacific Ocean in China. Thomas did find Mia on a snowy mountain in China. I'm sorry. I wish I hadn't upset you. Can we still be friends? He peeped. But before Mia could respond, an avalanche sent snow tumbling toward the engines. It blocked the way and sent Mia sliding off the track. Thomas was too small to pull her back onto the rails by himself. Just then, a Chinese engine named Yong Bao came crashing through the snow. He had a big plow to clear the way and was strong enough to pull both engines to safety. Good thing I came along when I did, Yong Bao said with a laugh. Thomas and Mia thanked Yong Bao for his help. I'm just glad you're bigger and stronger than me peeped to Thomas. We're bigger and stronger, too, when we work together, said Mia. So, where are you going now? asked Young Bao. Continent number five, Europe, chorused Thomas and Mia. Thomas and Mia made one more long journey, all the way through Europe to the island of Sodor. This is my friend Mia, Thomas peeped, as he introduced her to Emily, Percy, James, Henry, Edward, and Gordon. His friends steamed with happiness to see the two engines who had traveled around the world together. Thanks for watching! Click subscribe!